Okay. Quick intro and we'll get started. Yeah, I'm recording. I'm recording to the cloud. If um, Magdalene want, would want to uh, record it to your computer and you wanted live transcripts on. So let's see if we can do that for you. And on your share screen, I'm sure you know, but down there, and when you do share a screen, you'll see two buttons at the bottom on the left, and they say advanced video and advanced uh, audio. Click both of those. Uh, you may not, it may not affect you at all, but if you've got anything in your presentations that are video or have some audio to them, uh, they tend to desync unless you click those two buttons. We learned that the hard way. <laughs> so I think we're set. Okay, yeah. off to the races, um, off to the buzz. So uh, I'm Kit Hyatt, president of Puget Sound Beekeepers Association, and we're going to kick off with a, um, a fall preparation beginner lesson with Tracy, and um, probably at the end have some time for question and answer. Go ahead and enter your questions as we go along. Um, we'll try and keep up with them that way too. Um, I, I'll do a little bit of PSBA business at seven or so and pass the baton to Jerry um, for his presentation at about 7.30, maybe a little bit sooner. So welcome everyone and um, let's roll. Awesome, well, good evening, everyone. I'll get my screen sharing here. <laughs> Actually, go to the beginning. All right. So, as Kit mentioned, we're doing fall preparation, raising win healthy winter bees. And on the right hand side is a picture of one of my bees a couple of years ago on the knotweed. It is blooming in most areas. Even Kathy up north said that she's starting to see a little bit of knotweed growing up or uh, blooming up there as well. So, there should be a healthy flow going for those of you that have that noxious not weed around that makes fantastic honey. So what's it all about? Raising winter bees that are healthy is the key. And this uh, slide from one of Randy Oliver's uh, presentations in scientific beekeeping shows us right here the cusp of fall and now is when the varroa mites uh, really take off and start to overpopulate your colonies of bees and uh, cause problems. So. Varroa mites are the leading cause of colony death. And if you think, well, no big deal, I'm going to just let them die if, uh, if that happens, think about your neighbors. Um, this is my plea to think about your neighbors uh, because if your bees die from varroa mites, your neighbor's bees will go rob those out and uh, they'll take the mites home with them and it may cause their colonies to die as well. So, you might ask, what is a winter bee? And so the workers that are emerged the end of August and into September and October are called winter bees. And the reason why they're called winter bees is because they have enlarged fat bodies. And there's a really neat article uh, that you can if you're interested. And the reference uh, webpage is right there. And read the entire article, but it is pretty cool how bees make special uh, bees that have lots of fat bodies so that they can last over the winter. Uh, those fat bodies are essential for them to be able to raise brood in the spring and it enhances their immune system over the winter. So if you haven't yet, now is the time to do an alcohol wash. And I prefer the EasyCheck uh, bottle. They're pictured in the, um, the left-hand side. And you should treat your bees if there is a mite infestation of 2% or more. And so you sample two to 300 bees, which is a half a cup. It's very accurate, especially if you use 70% alcohol. And luckily this year, 50 and 70% alcohol is available everywhere. Last year, it was a little tricky. So we have a little exercise here. So this is a sample from 251 bees. And, uh, there are a lot of mites there. And so I'll give you guys a second to put your reading glasses on, lean in and uh, let me know uh, how many mites are in that easy check bottle.
go ahead and unmute yourself and yell out the answer if you know it. 28. Very close. 31. Also close. You guys bracketed it. There's 30. 30. Yeah, 30. 30. Too many. Too many. So that's a 12% infestation. And you can almost take this one to the bank that if this colony hadn't gotten treated, they would have died. All right. So popular treatment methods. Hope for the best. Eh, not hope for the best. So might away quick strips and formic pro are really popular this time of year because our temperatures have gotten down into the range that you can use them safely and effectively in your bees and you can use both with the honey supers on and it does kill the mites under the cappings. Apigard is a thymol based product and it is not to be used while the supers are on. It smells a lot like Listerine. So if you put this on with your supers on, the smell is pretty pungent. And I haven't tasted it before, but everything smells like Listerine when you're done. It airs out by the spring, but I would imagine that the honey pretty much tastes just like it smells. Oxalic acid is a really popular method when the bees are uh, broodless or have uncapped brood is the best time to use oxalic acid, either in dribble or vapor. And then Apivar is also really popular. Although I will admit I have never used it. I uh, prefer to use Apigard oxalic acid or Mite Away Quick Strips in my colonies. Whichever product you choose, make sure you read the label, please. Follow the label instructions to the letter uh, to avoid disaster or potential disaster. All right, and then the last slide. Should you be feeding syrup this fall? Well, that kind of depends. The syrup that you should switch to is two parts sugar and one part water. Notice I did not say measure by volume or by weight. Either one, the debate goes on and on and on. You can choose whichever is easiest for you. Two parts sugar, one part water. Now you do need to heat the water in order to get two parts of sugar to dissolve in it. And the best way to do that is to heat the water first and then add the sugar. If you heat the water and the sugar on the stove, you do risk, the, risk scorching the sugar and that can um, create something chemically that will actually um, be poisonous to your bees and you don't want that. So if the answer is yes to the, one of these two questions or both of these questions, if there's less than, 70 pounds of honey currently stored in your colony, then you need to feed. And a basic measurement is a deep frame is about eight to 10 pounds, fully capped honey. Medium frames are three to four pounds. And so you'll see a lot of rainbows in your, in your uh, top brood box. And so you just kind of guesstimate. Another way to figure it out is to reach and grab the back of the colony and lift up. And ladies, if you can't pick it up, it's probably over 70 pounds. And uh, gentlemen, if you can budge it off the, off the backside, uh, but it's pretty heavy, that's probably enough. Um, you also wanna make sure that your supers are removed in case you, um, you, know, you don't wanna adulterate your honey with sugar water. And then if your honey supers are on, still on, because knotweeds bloom in your area, wait to feed. And if you're, obviously if your bees have enough stored honey. People often ask in the fall, when do I stop feeding? And that's when the average daytime temps dip below 55. They won't eat it anymore anyway. So that's the time to take it off, store it in the freezer and uh, use it in the spring. And believe it or not, that's all I have. And I'll stop presenting. And um, then you guys can ask questions. And I haven't looked at the chat yet. There may be some questions. All right, I am not a Zoom user, obviously. Stop share, there it is. See four questions in the chat. How much syrup do you feed for how long? So 
right now is not a fantastic time to add lemongrass and other supplements to your syrup. So it does spoil faster, especially if it warms up. So I would just feed enough to last three or four days. And that really kind of depends on your colony. You have to kind of gauge that. Um, that way it doesn't ferment. Um, obviously fermented syrup water is not good. And the reason why I don't use any sort of lemongrass or other essential oils this time of year is that it does promote robbing. And so unless you have a really strong colony and a robbing screen on, it uh, is oftentimes disastrous because you end up getting robbed out instead. And the next question is, what should we do with uncapped super frames? Well, so if you have an uncapped super frame and you take it out and hold it up over your colony and then tip it horizontal and give it a hard shake, if no um, honey or nectar falls out onto the frames, then it's dry enough to go ahead and extract. If it's not, um, you can either take that out and freeze it for the winter or you can leave it for the bees. Anyone want to ask a question live? All right, while you're working up the bravery, Brian asks, uh, I'm having far worse yellow jacket problems this year compared to last. Are others having similar issues? Um, I don't know, I've had yellow jackets. Uh, I have, have had my robbing screens on since July. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand momentarily in a Zoom if you have, um, if you've got worse yellow jacket issues this year than last. I actually have found I have way less yellow jackets this year. And I think it might be because I moved my colonies off an area where there was a really steep slope and you could, no one could ever find colonies oh. or yellow. You know what I mean? It was like impossible to like sleuth them out and get them. Yeah. All right, Jerry's got his hand raised. Jerry, is that because you have a question or because you had Jerry Hoffmeister that is? Or you have a question or you have more yellow jackets? I was saying that I have more yellow jackets, but I've noticed that they don't like, they seem to mostly be eating dead bees and stuff like that. They're not really going in the hive. And it's only one that they're even around, like the other hives they don't seem to be interested in. And they're not like even the, it's, it's the strongest hive that they hang around by. It's kind of yeah. interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? Yeah, hi, this is Ophira and then I'm a first year beekeeper. Welcome. And I just wanna, thank you. I was uh, curious about how prevalent robbing is because I think I've been robbed. Um, I had a bunch of honey and it's gone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was just wondering like, you know, I know that you you close up sort of the, the landing board so the aperture is much smaller so that they can guard it. But is that, some, is that something that, that happens a lot typically? Other bees will come in and just Take all your stuff. They can, but we're just coming out of a dearth or a time during uh, August when it was hot and dry and there yeah. wasn't much for the bees to eat. So it's possible that your bees ate through all their spores. It could be. I mean, I'm up in uh, 2,300 feet uh, outside of Leavenworth. So it was actually, there were some, it was hot, but there's actually a lot of flowers still of various kinds. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's hard to say which one it is. And yeah, I don't know. If you, if you see frantic movement out front, uh, to me, it seems like when they're ro getting robbed, it, things are moving about one and a half times faster than they normally do outside. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't, also I didn't you'll find that. on your on your sticky board, you'll see a lot of wax <laughs> cappings because the mm -hmm. robbing bees have come in there and torn off all the wax cappings and they'll all fall all at once. And kind of look like. Uh, so based on that, I have been robbed. So now I know. <laughs> All right, thank you. Sure. Oh, we have a shy group tonight. Adam. Yeah, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is about the feeding about proton patties. Should we feed them with proton patties or not? And if should we until when? That's a great question. So the uh, question Adam asks is, should I be using pollen patties or protein patties right now? And the answer is maybe. So for those of you who went and 
did the homework assignment over the summer and watched the um, uh, reading the Combs presentation by Randy Oliver, you'll remember that the reading when you read the Combs, you see oftentimes honey is stored at the top of the frame, kind of in a rainbow. And then right below that, you should have an inch, inch and a half rainbow of pollen as well. Or if you don't have that, you should have pollen right next to where the brood is. So they'll often store a whole sheet or a whole frame of pollen right on the edge of where the brood is being um, taken care of. Because it's, you know, just like us, they want their pantry close to their kitchen. So um, it's important to make sure that you have pollen. Just like in with nectar in August, we don't have a lot of pollen in this area. So if your bees don't have any pollen stored in the, you know, in the brood area, then you definitely want to have a pollen patty on right now to help raise those winter bees. Um, I got a lot of questions over the August time frame uh, about, hey, I need a new queen because she stopped laying. Well, do you have pollen in your in your hive? And if the answer is no, then you probably didn't need a new queen. She just took a brood break because there wasn't enough um, pollen to support the additional brood at that time. So it's kind of, your answer is kind of a maybe. It, de it depends, Adam, how, what the resources are in your colony. Okay. Uh, my second question is about uh, a swarm prevention. Uh, if, if I'm just thinking, if I'm removing the super, I removed them, took the honey, and then I brought them back so the bees will have space. Now they will fill it up with, again, with uh, sugar honey uh, that I won't have nothing to do with that later. But if I'll remove it altogether, I'm worried that they won't have enough space and they will start to swarm. At what point I'll say, you know, they will just shrink. I shouldn't worry about that. Well, they're shrinking now. So after the solstice, they start to shrink. Okay. And so your bees might abscond right now because they either have no resources or the mites are so high that they're like, we are out of here, we can't stand it. But generally bees this time of year where we live will not swarm because, um, because of space they'll swarm because the situation is uh, bad in their, in their hive box. So you don't have to worry about smashing them into smaller spaces right now because they're on the decline anyway. Thank you. Uh -huh. Only crazy and desperate bees leave their box with resources this time of year. Any bees leaving their box at this time of year are likely to be heavily, severely infested with varroa mite. Exactly. All right, Kim, I guess that's it. Back to you early this time. Really? Yeah, they don't want to listen to me. They don't want to listen to Dr. I was Mulchak. trying to think of the question <laughs> I was going to ask, and I... And I should have written it down because it came and went with the next question. Um, I uh, oh, I want to know if you think that it's possible that the queen would stop laying because there's a dearth. That's definitely the one of the major reasons. But there's pollen. It's just that there isn't food coming in, and there's capped honey. It's mm. just. So still, yes. yeah. Both both my hives went completely silent for better part of three weeks without any eggs, even though they apparently had a queen. I thought they didn't, but they did. And I checked today; they have they have it now. But they had plenty of pollen, like they had frames and frames of pollen on. Pollen? <laughs> I yeah, I had really I had some hives really slow down, and um, now it's like it's like May. I don't know what is going on, but. Um, it's really, really common for my queens to take a brood break in August too. And you think that's just just the dearth, or just a natural cycle of it's season? The dearth. Yeah. Okay. Because I didn't feed anybody, so they didn't. I see that as an advantage because it breaks the brood cycle for the varroa mites too. Yeah. It disrupts it, their whole production at a really critical time. It's it, it's great as long as you sort of know it's not a problem and I it it all righted itself and I thought maybe my queens were on their way out 
and um, now they're they've bestowed beauty again. So all is right. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions before we um, leave our beginner lesson? Any questions about anything? Tracy, I have one quick question for you. Sure. So if if um, I've got like I fed my split and they, they just would not stop eating it, just freaked me out. They were just eat and they were just building so many. And I was, and they weren't, they didn't seem to be really storing that much. So um, I quit feeding them, but I left a uh, super on with um, pretty much every frame undrawn. I mean, I had like the double layer of wax frames. You know, I didn't paint them, but I bought them with double wax. Uh, and so, I mean, should I just remove that? I mean, I'm, I'm gonna check it in the next couple of days, but should I just pull that off now? Yeah, there's no sense to have that on yeah, I was thinking what you were saying about the knotweed, maybe they could be bringing in. Yeah, but some... if there's not a lot of stores, they'll store that in your upper brood box. Oh, okay. They're, they're probably not gonna draw much wax now. Yeah, okay, that's all right. Yeah, I hope I, I mean, I don't want to, but I might have to take some honey off my mother colony to get them through. Yeah, or start feeding two to one, but they're they're not gonna draw that wax out in that super. They're gonna store it in the wax they've already made. Okay. You can always combine next month too. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yep. Tracy, I just wanna point out there's questions in the chat. Uh -huh. So the only question that I see left is when do I take the robbing screens off? That's a great question. Um, after the last or after the first big frost, when you don't see any yellow jackets anymore, that's usually when I take mine off. And sometimes I leave them on all winter. So it's not required to take them off in the fall, but usually I do after it gets good and frozen and the and the yellow jacks are the yellow jackets are all dead and then I take it off and put an entrance reducer on instead. Yeah, I, I talked to a member who was having a lot of trouble with black bald, bald, bald black bald hornets. Um, and they were getting into the hive after dark when the bees were clustered. Oh, you know, that was Mobley because the bees were clustered and she's in a colder climate. Um, it made me realize, you know, because I've seen hornets too. I don't pay as much attention to them because I'm yeah. more oriented around the yellow jackets, but the hornets can gain some momentum too. Yeah. I, I just noticed too, Arthur asked, what's your technique for pulling frames and leaving bees behind? I'm assuming you mean pulling the honey out. And uh, Kathy taught me this. I take a sheet of plywood and I stick it on top of a garden cart and then I put an empty super on top of that. And then I shake all the bees off or use a, a feather. You can use a feather or a bee brush to, to shake all the bees off the frame and then put them in that empty super on your garden cart and then put another sheet of plywood or an extra inner cover or lid on top of that to keep the other bees out. And I, I actually, my colonies are pretty close together. So I actually have that garden cart a little ways off or out of the path of most of the bees. And I walk back and forth with each individual frame to reduce the number of bees that end up in that box. And then before I get to my back door, I double check again, because my dog really hates it when I get any bees in the house <laughs> and she runs off and won't talk to me for two days. So then I double check before I get them in the house and, and shake off any remaining. And then what happens to the box of bees? I don't know, the bees stay with the, with the colony. I shake all the bees off of the one frame at a time and stick it in an empty box. Oh, the, the frames go in the box. I heard yeah. you shaking the bees. Sorry. Yeah, the, fr the frames of honey go in the box one at a time and I quick put the lid on top. You can use those big, um, too. Some of them are just the right size, but I really like just using a, a spare box with two sheets of plywood or a lid. But that's exactly what I thought too, Kit. Thanks. Sorry, for my bad. Yeah. No, it's it's it was a silly vision. <laughs> Shake the yeah, bees yeah, away yeah. from the hive. 
like they're in shock and they need to rest. <clears throat> Go ahead, Rick. Um, you were talking about them not drawing out wax. Uh, about two weeks ago, I pulled a fully capped frame out because I was like, hey, this will be good. I'll stick it in the freezer. And then if they ever need it at some point, I can put it back in. And I put one new frame in my brood box. Uh, and in two weeks, they haven't really done anything with it. Is it, uh, I have larvae and everything. So I think there'll be bees of age that can make wax, but are they just not interested in doing that? And should I just put the honey one back in? Uh, you can put the honey one back in if, if they're not honey bound. Um... But, but they're not really interested in drawing wax right now, like you said. This time of year, they just don't want to do that? Okay. Okay. I, I was taught like the first of August, they pretty much quit. Well, remember kid, I don't beekeep by months anymore. I keep beekeep by the calendar or by the weather. <laughs> well, it would be a rough guess, but we yeah. are well yeah. into August yeah. now. Um, and uh, absolutes aren't really accurate in beekeeping. So usually they don't draw much wax after <laughs> in August. <laughs> I was just hoping that they would fill it and I'd have a backup also, you know. Sure. Generally, you don't want to have them draw foundation unless it's got a heavy nectar flow on. If they do draw it at all, and they generally don't, It'll be, it's obviously oftentimes a mess. So they draw, you draw your foundation when you're on heavy flows. Uh, if you miss the heavy flows, you might as well pack it in. It's not going to do you much good. It's a rare colony that will work it properly. Awesome. The question, what, um, Ann asks, what is honey bound? So honey bound is when you have uh, honey packed in all your frames and no room for the queen to lay anymore. Usually that's an issue in during the blackberry flow and that can cause swarming. But most of us now are considering feeding as opposed to, oh, I've got so much honey, I don't know what to do with it all. Hmm, okay. Um. So at seven o'clock, I guess we'll roll over to um, PSBA story time. Unless somebody else thinks of something. Oh, no, Tracy's gone. Okay, so um, I am, uh, hold on. Um, happy to welcome you all. It's a good crowd tonight. I'm very excited about our guest speaker. And I um, will introduce Puget Sound Beekeepers Association as a nonprofit um, and um, we are a 501c3 corporation and the, um, the board of directors is um, working behind the scenes to um, make things happen, although it's been pretty quiet relative to normal years because there's nothing happening in person. Um, I, uh, we are in November, we will have our annual elections. So just to send, set out a, a bee in your bonnet that if there's anyone thinking about being involved next year with PSBA in what we hope will be a much more normal year, then um, think about that and reach out. It's, it's great. We have a couple of openings on the board and would welcome your support and involvement. Um, and, um, the, for their lives under Taliban rule. And here's Michelle Kellerman reports. Oh Sorry. Um, and um, <laughs> yeah, that, that throws me sideways. So um, I, um, I know I, I updated everybody about the Asian giant hornet nest being, being found and encourage everyone who wants to follow along with that news, which has the next few weeks, I think will be kind of interesting um, just to, you know, you just subscribe to that news feed and they're wonderful about um, keeping the public involved. Um, if anybody's living, especially up in the Northern part of um, the county, uh, I, I would think that putting out traps 
would be a really excellent idea. And all the direction for how to do that is available um, through through the um, this the state uh, Department of Agriculture as well. So um, they really want our support, and um, and it's been very fruitful for the pro the, the the you know harnessing the um, whereabouts of the hives twice now. So. So um, I what I wonder if it's if I, what I would like to do is encourage anyone to set set anything out in chat that they're wondering about PSBA and what's going on um, because it may be something that everyone would be interested in knowing that you have a query about. Um, we we did not go live this year with our apiary at the arboretum. Um, we do have bees there, but we are, um, you know, keeping them, we're caring for them quietly instead of encouraging all the wonderful learning that happened through that. It, that so that, that's sad, but the case. Um, we do have our extractor rental program um, underway. This is kind of a good time of year. Often people have honey now to spin. Labor Day is kind of, um, for some people, a traditional time to spin honey. And um, so if there is an interest in extractors, uh, we have updated a lot about the plan, the program, including um, Anne and Mary Sue, who are volunteers who have stepped up to help uh, meet people at the apiary to, to hand over the extractors, and as well as the online um, agreement portion has been all updated. So. Um, Anyway, we're if you if you're curious about that, you can explore that online. Um, anything else? Does anybody have issues or questions? Heck, it's only five past seven. Um, I always just worry about members deciding to join the um, the guest part of the program. At exactly 7:30. Washington Fair. These are the Asian giant hornets. And Look then, the um, yep. not not being not being present for the beginning, but um, that's really all I have to share. And um, I would welcome any other comments, and or I'll turn it over to Jerry Early. Rick, that pup is dear. I like him. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. This gives you more time to tell us great stories. Okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, before we start here, um, we are still getting a few people that are logging in. Um, somebody by the name of Bruce made a couple of attempts. I don't know what his problem was. He could stay with joining, and then he disappeared on me. But uh, um, I'm going to ask you or Magdalene to keep an eye on those because. I, once I start talking, I'm not going to be able to watch uh, That's the fine. Uh, participants list. Uh, yeah. And the same I, thing I'm, is you feel free to ask questions via chat. What I intend to do is go through um, presentation I've got. And then when I finish the presentation, we can have a, a round robin, both live and chat question. Uh, also, either if either of you two could help me out in the chat. We do this with our WAS meetings. Have somebody go kind of watch the chat because chat can be all over the place and see if you see some questions that look particularly relevant. And then Kit or Megala, uh, if you, you know, you could toss those questions to me and then I don't have to try to, to deal with chats and that screen and so on at the same and, and go through it. So if somebody kind of keep an eye on, on both anybody joining in and also on the chat. So um, I'm delighted to talk to the Puget Sound beekeepers tonight because this is kind of, the, the, this. I've been working with bees for over 48 years and I continue to do so. Rumor has it that I retired in 2012, but uh, I've not been too successful at that. Um, I'm currently, teaching on as one of the co-instructors of the University of Montana's online master beekeeping program. I'm also the current president of the Western Apicultural Society. 
uh, which just as I became president and I hadn't attended to be president, the person who was supposed to be president decided to suddenly resign. And so I'm doing my third stint as the um, president of the Western Apiculture Society. And when they lost their president, I got a call from the executive board asking me whether I would agree to be the president. And I said, over my dead body, I meant it. <laughs> but unfortunately, I thought about it overnight and thought, well, no, we're supposed to have the next uh, was uh, annual meeting. This was late in 2019 and 2020 in Missoula. So I thought, well, you know, I, I at least know who I'm dealing with if uh, I'm the president. So, um, so I am the president. And then we had the delight of hitting COVID. Uh, we are intending and trying to have, not this year, but next year, Western Agriculture Society intends to try to have a face-to-face -face, uh, conference in Missoula, Montana. And we are in the mountains in the Western part of Montana. Uh, we also this year are doing monthly free mini conferences. And actually tomorrow night, um, if you go to the Western Apicultural, apiculturalsociety.org site, you can register for that. Um, and we have a Zoom webinar uh, panelist uh, format the speakers tomorrow night will be David Wick up in Florence, Montana, who has unique instrumentation and capabilities in analyzing samples, bee samples, pollen samples for bee pests and diseases. And we will have Dr. Dewey Karen from the yeah. Professor Emeritus from the University of Delaware, who now lives in Oregon. He was very much invested with, in involved with the Eastern Apiculture Society. He's now working with the Western Apiculture Society and he's our representative to the uh, Honey Bee Health Coalition. So those two will be talking tomorrow and these are free. So um, we encourage you to sign in for those. So that's my ad for the, the, the evening. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the things we've done and partially why I'm so happy to talk to the Puget Sound folks, that'll become you folks, That'll become evident in a moment. And we'll talk a little bit about bees and beekeepers and how they interact and some of the unusual things we do. If there's someone out there that deserves the name weird science, it would be me and my team. Uh, we've done things that no one else in the world has ever done. Uh, and I don't expect you to accept my say-so on that. I will try to show you hard data that the things we claim are real. So give me a moment here. I'm going to um, see if I got mine, uh, and it didn't come up. All right, hold on a moment. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, Kid or Magdala, um, at this point, you should be seeing my PowerPoint, and I'm seeing a version of it with notes. Is that If I haven't got my screens upside down, so are you I seeing the see PowerPoint? It. We can see yeah. your notes. Yes, thank you. You can see the notes of the PowerPoint? Both. All right, you should be seeing. We can see both, Jerry. Okay, how are you doing now? Now we see only the presentation. Okay, that's, I, I just before I signed on tonight, I had a second computer that was up and it decided to lose the internet connection. So you're seeing the PowerPoint at the moment, right? And, and I've got access to the notes. So, so if that's a, I'll trust that's okay. That's what you're seeing. So 
basically, I'm going to talk about tonight is communicating with bees. Though that seems like maybe a stretch, but we actually think that we can listen to them and understand some of the things that they're telling us. And maybe someday we might even be able to communicate with them on the other direction. But given that we haven't solved that problem with even our uh, our cat, our pets like cats and dogs, I don't. They seem somehow to know what we're saying much better than we know what they're saying. But uh, but we're working on it. So I've been studying insects and insect sounds since 1968. Um, I did my PhD thesis on insect behavior and population ecology, actually working with grasshoppers and specifically the use of grasshoppers of acoustic signals to attract and serenade potential mates as well as to warn off competitors and intruders. And actually that was an eye opener because uh, people didn't understand that grasshopper, male, female, male, male, female, female interactions and so on had a lot, not only visual, but a big acoustic component. Now in 1973, after I got my PhD at Montana State University in Bozeman, I moved to the University of Montana in Missoula and joined the team studying the bioenvironmental impacts of coal fire power plants in eastern Montana. Now, for those of you who are old enough to remember in the mid 90s, the Saudis decided to get together and they radically increased the cost of oil and that caused long lines at the gas stations. It was also the, the occasion of the first toilet paper shortage in the United States, simply because Johnny Carson joked about a shortage of toilet paper based on no particular reason at all. And he became prophetic in that and we've seen this play out again more recently, but that spawned a look back to the resources in the US and Canada, uh, trying to develop some self-sufficiency, wean ourselves off a bit of, forcibly wean ourselves off of fossil fuels from overseas. And they had anticipated building dozens of power plants in the semi-arid prairie regions of Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas. And how I, I went out there as an entomologist to do some of the entomology work. But when I got there, I found 6,000 colonies of bees in the area immediately surrounding the power plants at Coal Strip. And it seemed I'd be remiss if I didn't look at possible impacts. I was fortunate enough that the lab I joined at the University of Montana was an analytical chem lab, in addition to being the ecology lab. And as such, um, we were able to use to analyze pollen and bees and wax from the co colonies to see if we picked up any of the effluents from the power plants. Now, at the time, these were supposed to be some of the cleanest power plants in the world, yielding something like seven pounds of fluoride per day from a smokestack, which should have dispersed out to almost minimal effects uh, across the region. However, um, when we got, I got there, uh, we found out that with bees, we could trace the emissions, especially with things like fluoride, from the power plants 20 or 30 miles away, we could pick them up in bees. And bees did better than any other approach, including flying lasers in planes to follow plumes. So that really shocked EPA. And we were working with EPA in Corvallis, Oregon at the time. And they came back and said, there's a big Superfund site out around Seattle and Tacoma called the Commencement Bay Superfund site. And it is particularly focused on arsenic that is being released from the Sarkel smelter, uh, copper smelter at Tacoma. And I said, well, you know, I'm game for this if you are. And, and so, I ended up, you know, not knowing nothing about arsenic, um, but they, I had to buy a new instrument for the lab just to be able to analyze for things like arsenic and cadmium. We were uh, set up to do sulfurs and um, uh, basically sulfur and fluoride in the lab that I joined. And EPA said, we'll buy you the instrument, uh, but we want you to look at arsenic and we want to see if you can use bees in the commencement bay area to do what you did in Eastern Montana. Well, the only way I was able to use bees in, in the commencement Bay Area is doing it the same way I did in Montana. 
I couldn't afford to buy all those bees or put all those bees out, so I went to the beekeepers keeping the bees, which led to my introduction to beekeepers in Thurston, Pierce, King County, and Whidbey Island. And some of the names that some of your older members um, may not be a whole many of those around that will remember these people, but one was Miriam Bishop, who at the time was the Washington State Beekeeping Association president, and she lived on Bashan Island. Roy Thurber, who wrote your newsletter for over 15 years, was writing the newsletters. Uh, and down in Pierce County, uh, one of the people that I still stay in connection with and correspond with is Ray Nettleback. And there was a gentleman by the name of Ray Robinson, a retired military man who had a bee barn, bee supply uh, facility down there uh, right out of Puyallup. Well, with the help of all of these beekeepers and their associations, we established a citizen science network of bees and beekeepers that extended from Yelm to Oak Harbor. These beekeepers sampled bees for us, collected pollen, and survey brood survival. We had a test that they went into the brood nest and they pinned marked areas of brood and then they followed the, the uh, development from egg, larva, and pupa and the survival rates. And the results we got back amazed everyone, the beekeepers, EPA, the Pazapka air pollution folks, and ended with a paper being published in Science with a very prestigious journal on February 5th, 1985. And I mentioned this to Kit. She said she wasn't able to pull the paper down. I will scan this paper and make it available as a PDF to, your folk, to you folks. But essentially, we covered this very large landscape area from uh, all the way from Yelm up into Whidbey Island, almost to the northern reach there. And over to the right on this uh, slide, you'll see various maps and ways of breaking down where arsenic was going, the probability um, isoplet, which is in, uh, in C, the highest levels are shown in B. Uh, that first one, A, is the one that really knocked everybody's socks off because that arsenic from that shelter was reaching far beyond what anyone ever imagined. Uh, the company at the time was arguing that their impact only went a half a mile to a mile. And this information um, eventually ended up being used in EPA hearings and was a key part of the argument to shut down the Asarkel smelter. Um, and that was all based on what bees and their keepers and members of your club and some of the other clubs, but the Puget Sound Beekeeping Club and the Pierce County Club were the uh, mainstay of this. And you did something unusual, uh, never been done before. So give me a moment, for some reason. Sorry. Okay, for some reason my slides were hanging up there. So an interesting footnote to all this is that in 2003, uh, the Puget Sound Air Pollution Control Agency contracted work with the University of Washington and they produced the Tacoma Smelter Plume Site Credible Evidence Report, which was considered to be one of the most intensive and extensive studies of soil contamination with heavy metals contaminants like arsenic and cadmium uh, as basically residuals left over from the years when the smelter was active. The smelter actually closed somewhere in 1985, 86. Um, and I got a phone call from Gregory Glass, the uh, author, prime author after they published the re report. And you can actually find this one on the internet. And Gregory Glass, pointed me to, wanted me to know that I should read the following from that report. And this is a direct quote. It says, the impacts of smelter emissions have also been studied using bees. Based on travel patterns, bee colonies are identified with ambient air trace element contaminants over local areas. That's talking primarily about the Bashan Island work we did of about seven square kilometers and a regional network of beekeepers, that's you guys or your predecessors, 
who were recorded, recruited to provide data from 72 locations over a 7,500 square kilometer area. CREGI, now that's a, a, a form of uh, geospatial statistics. CREGI techniques were applied to the data to produce contour maps of arsenic content in bees over the sampling region. And we all, as you see, we, we did some other things too, but in this particular thing, they were focused on the arsenic. And the, the um, Tacoma smelter study noted that our results showed a clear pattern associated with the smelter, which we characterize extending at least to the Lake Sumamash, uh, tongue-tied there, plateau. I'll let one of you locals tell me how to pronounce that properly. In a separate investigation, this is the Vashon Island work, uh, smaller bee colonies, we set out nucleus colonies, were established at a bisex and transect from the north to the south of the island. And the biomass, that is the size of the bee populations, increased as the distance away from the smelter increased. And these colony biomass or population size values were inversely correlated with the arsenic content. In other words, the lower end of the island got the brunt of the arsenic, and that arsenic really was having an adverse impact on the bee population. So he called me up to tell me that their study independently confirmed our study of almost 20 years earlier. And I was delighted because 20 years after we did the work with your help of your folks, we had a paper that was published in Science that actually was confirmed. Um, and until these, this Tacoma Smeller Plume Site study, no one else had actually uh, characterize the impact of that smelter as far as we had. And some years later on, on the island, up in Upper Canada, I talked to their equivalent of EPA, and they said that they always thought that they had elevated arsenic on their sampling systems, probably due to some type of geological, you know, the type of soil and rock that was in the area because it's mostly volcanic. And it turned out that when they shut down the smelter, the arsenic levels on the island decreased dramatically. And once again, the only thing, the only study that had ever indicated that the Tacoma smelter might be impacting a region extending up into an offshore from Canada itself was our B study. All of which made it really nice. Uh, as nice thing to see. So, the success of that commencement bay landscape level study led to lots of other studies, a lot of them on Department of Energy uh, sites like the Hanford site, the Idaho Engineering site. Uh, we got involved in a post Chernobyl radionuclides study with uh, some folks over in Croatia. We did independent studies, and there was an independent study done by Tim Harmon using bees at the Department of Energy LANL site. Uh, where they were using bees to check whether anything was leaking out of waste disposal sites. All that led up to in the mid 1990s of a series of multiple site assessments for the Department of Defense, particularly the US Army Edgewood complex north of Boston. And their problem was they had dozens of waste sites with uncharacterized, some oftentimes unknown materials in them some of those were explosives, some of them were fuel, uh, some of those uh, were highly toxic, and they were scared to death that if any one of those uh, sites were to have something like a, a discarded bomb that they thought was neutralized but wasn't, uh, explode, that they basically could send a toxic plume down to Boston, which was only 16 miles away. So they wanted to know whether we could do what we did to help them characterize the waste sites for which they had very poor documentation. They didn't know what was in a lot of those waste sites. They even didn't know where a lot of those waste sites were. And they also wondered whether we could use bees like a canary. And so we built the world's very first electronic sensor loaded hives communicating over the internet 2 a.m. in the morning because of the vast amounts of data we were transferring and the cost for telephone transfer. We didn't have the internet back then. And we put those highs around some of these facilities as a warning system in case anything nasty was to essentially be released. And that 
again led to the very first fully center equipped hives, the very first long distance management of hives and monitoring of hives from Maryland to Montana uh, over phone lines at that time, and the very first patents on hive sensor monitoring technologies, which we have. Now, fast forward to 2006 and colony collapse disease, and we got involved with that, and we started looking not at chemical, physical chemical um, contaminants, but we started looking to see whether the cause of CCD was chemical, pesticide, industrial, or whether it might be some type of biological agent. And we got a volunteer stepped up to that, the US Army's Edgewood um, Troop Protection Lab that provided some very unique instrumentation. And we were able to do proteomics, uh, PCR and viral screenings of apiaries that we sampled from the period of 2006 to the period of 2010. So the significance of this is it moves us from, chem from physical chemicals to the look at biologicals. And this quick little thing gives you an idea that we could, the type of things we've looked at and we're able to characterize using beehives in the US and, with, and in Europe with our friends in Croatia out of th things found in soil, plant, water, air, and vegetation. And we even got into looking at things like could bees be used to pick up anthrax? And the press went nuts and had a lot of fun making up cartoons. So um because we not only look for things like anthrax but we we, we got a lot of uh, press for the use of bees looking for landmines and so this is how forbes magazine thought bees might be used for landmine detection now in the 1990s that 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 landmine detection cartoon uh was derived from uh the federal agency called darpa that's the defense advanced research projects agency who approached us out in Aberdeen and Edgewood area in Maryland, looked at our smart hives and our bees for sampling and asked whether we could use bees for active monitoring in addition to passive monitoring. Now, a little bit of definition here. By passive monitoring, what we're talking about is bees go out, they fly around, they do these things, and they inadvertently bring back samples of everything we're looking for. And we can collect then bees and pollen and wax at the hive and look for them. The bees didn't go out intending to pick these things up, they just inadvertently picked them up. So we call that passive monitoring. But what DARPA wanted to know is, could we turn this around and get the bees to show us where some of these harmful chemicals were at? Um, and could we monitor not only adverse effects on bee colonies in time, the canary in the coal mine type of model, but could we get the bees to show us where they found chemicals of interest? And they called that active monitoring. The bees actively search. Well, that then generated many years of studies that we did for DARPA, the US Department of the Navy, the US Army, and it produced patented methods that we own the patents for monitoring colony dynamics in real time, the very first smart hives. Patented methods for conditioning or training bees to search for chemicals of interest there were emitted from landmines, IEDs, drug labs, dead bodies, et cetera. And decimeter resolution LIDAR, which is a form of laser. And these are instruments that we use to detect and map the location of flying bees over large areas without needing any marks or tags on the bees. We took, only took us 10 years to develop those um, laser systems. So you ask about, bee behavior. And so one of the oldest and simplest ways of using bee behavior was to test what types of chemicals bees could perceive. And what you do is you kept, as simple as catching bees, sticking them in a straw like you see here. They're alive, they're healthy, there's, they're fine. And then you puff a puff of uh, air with a scent that you wonder whether bees can detect and you give them, alternate that or randomize that with puffs of air without the scent. And when they smell the scent that you want them to detect, and if they flip up their mouth parts, it literally is like, it's just like a spring going up. In response to that scent, you take a, 
a eyedropper and you give them a droplet of rich syrup reward. And it's surprising how fast they learn that they'll get a reward if you if they respond to the scent or smell that you want to see if they can detect. And when we started this, this kind of system with you know straws and and aquarium pumps to to puff up the air and bees with a little tape over their back and so on was where this assay was at from a technological standpoint. But by the time we DARPA rolled in and saw this, DARPA funded us and others. And there were even little suitcase systems that you could carry around with bees in it. And you had an airflow system that went through them. And they had video cameras on the bees inside of the little suitcase and so on. And they were using the bees to um, detect, you know, they, they used the suitcase with the air pump on it as a snorkel. And if the bees responded, um, then they knew that the bees had picked them up because these captured bees couldn't fly. So they were carrying the bees around the points they wanted to test. And there was a company in England, in the UK, called Insentinel. And their whole business model was based on using bees to smell things, or I don't know if they, we could say they really smell things, but detect olfactory signals through the antenna. And they were even looking at things, uses like, can bees be used to detect when strawberries in grocery stores are starting to go bad? Or can bees be used to detect cancer in humans? And so we've gone from a very primitive per system to some very sophisticated systems. Now, we and others have looked, used PERS to see whether bees can detect explosives or a whole array of chemicals, uh, rank flowers for attractiveness. Uh, you know, if you got a new hybrid plant that's got a high yield, is it still attractive to a bee? Well, you could use this system to look at that. Uh, are there drugs in the area? And the chart you see below is from some of our work and ammonia nitrates, what they use in Oklahoma for the bomb, and putrescin is from a decaying body. So that um, there's a variety of things there that you can see. Um, anise is a, actually is a floral scent. It's not real common in nature, and it's something bees really love. I mean, you don't really have to do much to train bees on anise. They seem to be hardwired for looking for anise. Uh, fuel and nitrate combinations, again, another type of bomb or IED, cadaverine and putrescine are things that you find from dead bodies. Uh, we actually buried pigs and the um, bees could find the buried pigs. Now, all that gave DARPA and the military a pause and they wanted us to see if we could find landmines because buried landmines eventually break down, crack and start to leak and emit vapors that uh, can be detected, but they're very faint. They're often in parts per, parts per trillion, uh, parts per billion at the best, parts per trillion, sometimes even lower. And that required two, three things. One, we had to be able to train the bees. Second, they had to be trained on some type of chemical that was representative of the breakdown products of the explosives and other materials used in the most common types of landmines. And then we had to find a safe way of seeing where our trained bees went because nobody wants to walk across the landmine field just to see if the bees are out there. So what you see in the upper left corner here is it took, only took us 10 years, but that's one of the two LIDAR systems that we use to sweep a field, image a field and map where all the bees are at. And the picture you see on the upper right our charts and graphs that appear in real time as we detect bees and other insects across the area we're sweeping. That shows up on a, on a computer monitor, a portable computer. And the map below is a 3D representation of a segment of a real minefield uh, that has uh, boxes of, of TNT and small anti-personnel mines and larger dinner plate size uh, anti-tank mines. And you, as you might expect, the larger the source from, a, from an anti-personnel mine to an anti-tank mine uh, to a box of TNT, generally the greater the amount of vapor coming off. And you can see in this uh, depiction here, just one quick example of mapping a minefield for the presence and location of landmines. 
Here's another one that we actually published. This is a 2D representation. This is a test grid down at Fort Leonard Wood in, um, uh, in, in the Southwest or Southeast, excuse me, um, uh, in Missouri. And the DARPA built a test facility and there's a grid and Sandia National Lab chemists and I had an explosive expert buried uh, the targets, only they know what's under each of the grid points. Uh, the maps here, as you might guess, the colors and so on, the, the cooler colors um, are areas that they didn't pick up anything. Uh, the small uh, light colors uh, are the smaller ex buried explosives. And the big red, yellow, and orange are larger things. They got really big hits. And the bees had a perfect score. Uh, this just another one of those things that, that amazed anyone. Now, for any of you who are military, you probably uh, may know Fort Leonard Wood. It's a training facility, uh, oftentimes referred to as Fort Lost, Lost in the Woods. So one of the things that we did is that, you know, even DARPA was a little skeptical that the bees could do what we said they do and, and couldn't re had a hard time believing those maps and so on. So they challenged us with to undergo 36 continuous weeks of testing where we trained the bees and a crew of scientists and military employees from Brooks Air Force Base, essentially in a locked um, building with had cameras on the targets of a test facility at uh, Southwest Research Institute in, in San Antonio, Texas. And they, day after day after day, monitored the visits to various targets and uh, blank targets, low level targets, uh, higher level uh, vapor targets. The targets were made up and put out again by personnel for Sandia. Colin Henderson and myself and my crew trained the bees, but we had no idea of what target was real and what was a blank. And they locked us even out. We couldn't even go in and, and look at the, at the video streaming into the trailer. Then they took two different, all the videos and looked at every single frame using two different teams to look at every single frame. And it took almost over a year, of almost two years. And out the other end, they came up with this chart, which is published in a RAND report to uh, the White House. And this is something called a receiver operating curve. It's used for things like uh, how good is a, is a radar system. So that insert light blue with that curve in it, that's the hypothetical sensitivity curve going from zero to one on the y-axis and um, similar type of thing on the x-axis. And that's the curve of a good, um, radar system, just for comparison. Now, you notice on the radar system how far below that upper left-hand corner with a one at it that a good radar falls. And the y-axis is probability of a true detection, and the bottom or x-axis is the probability of a false detection. Again, that hypothetical radar curve is above what would be the... Uh, uh, the breakaway point, if you went from the zero in the bottom left to the top right on a straight line, that's kind of the 50-50 point. Notice that I had to rescale the one for explosive vapors. In this case, it was a marker called 2,4-dinitrotoluene, which was measured at, when measured at PPB levels, part per billion, the blue line, oh, the red line shows how good the bees were at a thousand fold less at parts per trillion. The blue line shows how good the bees were. And notice that the part per billion one is as close to near perfect up in the left upper right corner as you could ever get in this type of a presentation. So actually the guy that was heading the team from Brooks was really skeptical about what we claimed the bees were doing. After two years of parsing, looking at our data and so on, he came back and said, I have never seen any sensor 
whether it's a, a physical one, some type of instrument, biological sensor, never seen anything like the accuracy that we have from these bees, because you'll notice that on that y-axis, uh, the bottom part of it is not going to zero, it's going to 0 0.9988, and we're somewhere in the 0 0.996, 9996 uh, levels, that part per billion and part per trillion. And we have video of bees picking up the scent from these buried explosives on that test site at distances of 30 yards or more, and they start flying, oscillating down and following the wind, following the plume down to the source where the source at one foot above the ground was emitting about 15 parts per, per billion maximum. Uh, oftentimes uh, uh, down in the parts per trillion level around you know as low as five to 10. And if you're picking it, if a bee's picking it up 10, uh, 30 yards away, that means the bee's sensitivity is somewhere in the instantaneous recognition of the explosive vapor in the parts per quadrillion range. And, and that just blows everybody's mind. Well, all that then set us up for yet another twist on all this. We did a lot of the work uh, in Edgewood for Fort Detrick uh, in Maryland. Uh, they're the biowarfare folks, uh, part of the army that looks at things like anthrax and so on. And following a sarin attack in, in Japan and some other areas, the US Army at Yusasir in Fort Detrick called for, released a proposal asking for sentinel systems, the canary in the mine uh, example again, that could detect poisonous gases within 15 minutes of release. Well, we won a contract and we failed though at the Army request because our bees responded to low concentrations of hazardous chemicals, toxic chemicals, not in 15 minutes or less, but in 15 seconds or less. And we, at the time, looked at a lot of different signs of exposure among those bees. Um, we saw everything from drunken stumbling bees to guard bees kicking out contaminated bees trying to come back to memory loss and other measurable behavioral um, responses. But most of those required some type of uh, visual screening and some type of um, behavior recognition and a lot that became costly in a hurry. But one of the things that turned out to be really quick, reliable and easy to measure was the change in colony sounds upon exposure to as, less, to as little as one milliliter or one drop of toluene and a whole colony would roar. So our students came back, they were doing the dosing and the testing and they said, you know, the one thing that's just obvious is these bees sound off every time uh, they're exposed to some of these chemicals. And that, I wasn't surprised to hear that. Remember my PhD research looked a lot at acoustic signals in insects I myself can hear a colony that's gone queenless. Eddie Woods, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, was a UK, UK sound engineer who could hear colonies ready to swarm and actually build a little suitcase sensor system looking for a specific frequency shift to indicate that a colony was ready, ready to swarm. He patented and sold some of those systems. And you can go on the internet now and find uh, modern versions of his apodictor that he produced. James Bach, one of your former Washington Bee inspectors, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago, said he could hear colonies heavily infected by varroa mites after the mites were introduced in the United States. And our own results indicated that bees sounded off for a wide range of chemicals. And not only that, but they produced unique sounds for different chemical categories. And for all of that work, we were actually nominated by the US Army for a National Innovation Award. Somebody else got the actual award, but we were pleased to be nominated. So essentially, bee colonies can announce when they're contacted with hazardous chemicals, whether the chemicals reach the hive or their foragers encounter a plume. And that got us wondering, well, we know we can do that. We can pick out chemicals, 
using the sound of the bees. But how do we know that the, that an unhealthy or sick colony wouldn't make similar sounds to those produced by the chemicals? And then that led to the issue of, could we use colony sounds to monitor and assess colony health? And that turned us away from the military and over to the USDA and the Small Business Innovation Research and, and the Montana Department of Commerce Awards for small business uh, innovation ideas. And we spent nearly a decade looking at this question. And the answer surprised us. Turns out we can determine more about colony health based on the sound they produce than we ever would have guessed. And for some pests and diseases, some bee pests and diseases, we can rank the severity of infection or infestation based on the colony sound. Now, I'm going to bore you with a few charts here, but for those of you who are science or mathematically um, oriented, I want, I, I made a lot of assertions here. So I want to show you this is, and, and all this stuff went in monthly reports to DOE, monthly reports to the Department of Defense, monthly reports, uh, to USDA, annual reviews by uh, peer panels and so on. A lot of this information was not published in the open literature because any of the military work was considered to be not necessarily military secrets uh, or classified, but certainly sensitive military information. Because what we could do could possibly be either countered by and any, any of our en enemies, and some of those have possibility of being used for weaponization. So um, my apologies, but I, there's a need to know for some of that information. But some of the things I can show you. So I told you the bees could detect different chemicals. And this is a three-dimensional statistical plot. And we had a blank air control, naphthalene, ammonia, and toluene in this particular set of chemicals and bees were and small new colonies were exposed to a drop or a puff of this type of these chemicals and the different colors are the different type of chemicals or blank and the way this works is if those clusters by color don't overlap then they're highly statistically significantly different and as you see, except for a very tiny little bit of overlap on that yellow and green one and the green and the green, what we're seeing here is almost near perfect discrimination of not only the chemical, but the sound that the bee colonies produce that these charts are based on are uniquely different from each one of those chemicals. That's led some chemists to look at what we're doing and say, this is like doing GC mass spec instrument, instrumental analysis, only the B becomes the GC mass spec. Uh, that, that really shakes them. They, they, they have a hard time wrapping their head around that one. And in fact, this chart's the one that got us the Innovation Award nomination. So all of you know, and I hope some of you can hear a queenless colony. And from the time the colony goes queenless over a period of days, the sounds that they produce changes. So this is a kind of a messy chart, but what we're looking at is a queenless, the, the blues are uh, queenless on day zero, the green is queenless on day one, the yellows are queenless on day two, uh, the kind of purple or queen right. Um, and you can see, we're starting to see these separations. And we're seeing different sounds on a day-to-day -day basis, depending on how long it's been since they lost their queen. So the other next question we thought was, well, could we pick up varroa mites? And yes, indeed we can. And although we may have trouble picking up medium, medium high and high separating them out, you can still see that there's actually a gradient going there. You can see colonies with low levels of varroa mite are distinctly different, except for that one outlier point and the controls are completely different. So we not only can pick up a colony that has varroa mite, but we can tell you whether it's got a low, medium, or high level of mite. Now here's the one that really, I'm still scratching my head over. We can do the same thing for no moderate or high levels of American fowl brood. And since as far as I know, the larvae and the eggs don't make any sounds, 
and the pupa's caps, so if they were making any sound, they probably wouldn't hear them. This means that the adult bees, whether it's the nurse bees, I'm guessing that might be the measure, those bees are changing their sounds when fowl brood is present in, is present in the colony. And again, like with rolamite, it actually is able to rank or grade the level of infection or infestation. Now, I don't know whether this means the nurse bees are doing something like yelling, hey, we got a real problem down here, or where the AFB in a brood nest to a bee is about like COVID in a COVID ward, and they're letting everybody know, stay away. Uh, I, I'm just, you know, I'm being somewhat facetious here. But this again, this one, I really don't understand. I can understand why a bee would change the sounds it's making if it's being, uh, if it's uh, preyed upon by a mite, I mean, this mite's about the size of a basketball uh, to us, would be to us. If you imagine a basketball chopping on us, I think we might be a little irritable and might sound off and complain about it. But uh, uh, so it didn't surprise me we could pick up gorilla mite, but it still befuddles me of how we're picking up American fowl brood. Now we also looked and we can, we can determine and discriminate canolian bees from um, Italian bees, so we can pick up somewhat differences in it. If we get a bigger jump when we look at European bees versus uh, Africanized bees. Uh, but in this particular case, we had a yard where they were doing research on varroa, uh, varroa levels in Carniolian colonies, and their uh, comparison were to uh, colonies in other yards that were Italian or some other race, some type of non uh carny race and what we see is that the uh, this is none one of these complex charts but when you start studying it, what you see is that the carny sound different from all the others when they start off um the other bee races and so on are still kind of over where the carnage are at and so on and then when the varolo mite weighs in on top of all this it washes out the differences between the races and it stabilizes again as the varrola producing unique sounds that are similar uh, in terms of level infestation, regardless of what race of bee we're looking at. All of this makes, makes for really intriguing uh, um, notions and questions about how they're doing all this and exactly how far we can push this. Well, Coming back to why I'm happy to work with the Puget Sound Beekeepers Association and happy to address you today. Our citizen science, or we call it part public participation, but it's be, those things are renamed citizen science these days. In the 1980s, introduced the world to honeybees as samplers of air, water, soil, and vegetation over both local small scale like our Vashon studies and landscape scale areas. That is the greater Puget Sound Commencement Bay region. Citizen science was shown to be a means of accomplishing multi-point assessment of Im impacts of chemicals. In other words, it costs a lot of money to send out uh, research uh, personnel um, to sample multiple sites. And if you have to set up air samplers and so on, there's a significant cost there. Everything from the instrument itself to the setup, to the power that's recorded, to going out and collecting the records. Uh, and so, a volunteer citizen group can help us reach many, many more points than is affordable or even possible under more conventional large scale areas and surveys. And the geospatial statistics that we use were actually borrowed from the petroleum industry. Where do you drill the next oil well? And it was the first application to biological data. And as such, it also benchmarked a change. And now the, these geostatistics and particularly the one called Creeging, uh, has uh, had follow-up studies for all kinds of landscape insect work. Uh, and, but we were the first to publish, and that's because of our friends over at Pacific Northwest Laboratories that were helping us with statistics. So our science paper <laughs> launched decades of studies about bees and beekeepers, multiple media samplers, averaging concentrations of pollutants over time, over large areas, and with in yielding huge amounts of ecotoxicological data. That then branched off into active monitoring, as I said, from PERS to flying bees that train to find things. 
And so you see things like laboratory assays, not only by ourselves, but others using PERS electro antennagrams, where you plug into the antenna of the insect as a sensor. Free flying colonies, the trained colonies of bees, which search for specific odors, which could range from landmines, drug labs, as I said, and most more recently, we're starting to work for places like California and Florida. We just finished the Florida study on searching out introduced exotic af giant African land snails. Um, and so uh, we're, we're really pushing that uh, trained bees to find almost anything that has a scent. And for some things where you fall in the military approach of the canary in the mine, where we use the bee colonies as sentinel systems or first alerts to the presence or release of toxic chemicals. And we also know that we can do this for a bunch of biological things like anthrax. So now we brought this full circle back to bees, back to beekeepers, actually, as of tonight, back to Puget Sound beekeepers and colony health. Although we developed this capability with colony sounds or songs early in the 2000s, I'm talking specifically now about the sounds that bee colonies produce. There are a variety of technology barriers that prevented us from really being able to utilize this for anything other than research or very expensive uh, specific uses such as the military sentinel uses. However, in 2012, the, one of the barriers fell away when Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, and other credit card size, low powered, uh, fast processing, basically handheld computers came on the scene. And that's essentially enabled us to not take and have to go back to a workstation at a lab to process the data, but that still was too slow to really do what we wanted to do. But it brought the cost down and we produced the first um, kind of honeybee tricorder, the star uh, tracker. Uh, you'll understand what I'm talking about, but the first tricorder for bees. And we began to launch into what we now refer to as our uh, attempts to understand and identify the songs of bees. Now, um, the science paper looked at passive pickup of chemicals, uh, but as I say, when we got to the acoustic signaling, we found that uh, with that the 2012 Raspberry Pis that took 20 minutes or more to analyze recordings, <laughs> so you could take it to the field, but you still didn't have, and you didn't have to use a workstation or a benchtop computer to analyze the data, but 20 minutes was still too long. But with the eight series of iPhones and Android phones, uh, at least the better phones, the upper end ones like Samsung 8, 8 Plus and the iPad, uh, iPhones of that, we have as of this time from version eight onward, if you've got a higher end phone, the analysis time that it takes our app on a smartphone to process a recording from a beehive is down to 10 seconds or less. So in 2019, uh, and it was 2018 that those phones got so much faster. Up until that time, nothing was doing it in less than 20 to 30 minutes. So in 2019, we produced the first smartphone acoustic app, set up a, a Kickstarter campaign and came up with 500 testers. Well, COVID slowed things down. So in 2020, we found we needed to upgrade the app. The, our testers really wanted to use it in ways we hadn't anticipated. Well, we spent most of 2020 upgrading the app, testing it, and we are now moving to the next stage of testing the app, calibrating the app, and hoping to go after the goal of real-time monitoring of bee pests and diseases on national levels, national internet level. Um, and again, all with citizen science. So as of this spring, Bee Health Guru, which is the name of our app, is the app there where the bees tell you what's wrong with them. And our primary objective is A, to calibrate the app recordings. Now the analysis we get for Varola mites, that was all done on still fairly small regions of bees in similar type equipment using high-end recorders and high-end workstation um, computers. The question that we have to add is how much difference is there in the recording from an iPhone to an Android phone? How much does it differ by the hardware from, as an artifact, 
fact of the hardware if you use a cheap Chinese phone or really high end phone. Do you have to use a high end phone? Can you use the microphone in the uh, phone itself, which we were asking people to do, or should you be using a external microphone where everybody's using the same microphone as a way of standardizing the recordings? And that's not a fast process. It's the same way that all the speech recognition was developed, but it took over a decade to get speech recognition for human speech. And we're trying to do it for insect speech, but we need lots and lots of data and we need help. So as of 20, so the app at the moment is called Be Health Guru KS. You can access the app on a website that I'll give you later. You can't go to the web, the app stores and download it without first uh, getting uh, an authorization from us. This way we know who's getting the app, whether they know anything about bees, where they're at, and hopefully whether they understand what we want them to try to do with the app. But as of 2021, um, the app has two parts. One is a uh, analysis, of, the microphone goes in, takes a 30 to 60 second recording of B sounds, and then analyzes it using artificial intelligence machine, uh, uh, basically machine processing to survey and screen the sounds, and then to try to, uh, to estimate or assess what problems, if any, that bee colony has. Uh, that's the, the end game, the long-term one, that eventually, just the, simply the sound the bees produce uh, can be used to accurately say how healthy the bees are, a form of wellness for bees. Um, but it also has an inspection report piece to the app. And that's so that we can find out which of the recordings the app got right. If the app says your colony is queenless and you got a queen, then obviously that recording was, was not process, did not, was not interpreted properly. If the app says you don't have a queen and you got a queen or, or all those combinations, we need to know those so that we have examples that we can use to, and here's where the software is really interesting. It can learn as long as we can provide them with verified or vetted Recording. Recording says this, here's what we see when we inspect the hive. Now that inspection report was there so that we could calibrate the app for smartphone devices because they're not like our you know, one brand, one type of uh, recorder that we're using. Uh, however, people really liked it because we were looking at eight major colony health variables and they wanted to know whether they couldn't use the map uh, it couldn't use the app to manage their own bees. And all the data was going up to the, to the cloud. And once they sent the, uh, the data to the cloud, they lost their records. So it took a fair amount of work, but over 2021 or 2020 and now in 2021, we've released an app where you can use the app, even if you don't use or pay any attention to any of the acoustic part of it, you can use it for your own bee inspections and record keeping. But one of the things that is really important is that if you upload an inspection report to us, whether with the recording or without, the moment you upload that inspection report, it immediately goes into uh, a cloud storage place and it's immediately uh, reported and a pin is put in the map in the same way as outbreaks or, or patients that test positive for COVID show up and, the, and we're producing maps just like that. And the maps are produced automatically. The moment you put in your data, there's a pin in the map and it shows up uh, in the report. So what we're going for here, and this is one of the reasons why I failed in my retirement. My vision here is we hope that we can reach to the point where we can use smartphones and sensor systems put into highs. And we're working with a company, two companies now that are putting sensor systems in highs with microphones to eventually make it so that bees tell us when they're sick and you get to know when they're getting sick, not after they're too far gone to be able to recover uh, or you have to take uh, des desperate steps to do that. But we want to replace things like BIP rather than do a survey that you fill out in the winter time and you estimate how many colonies you thought died or and survived and how many were doing well or not. And then you confound that by guessing 
what might have caused him to die, not knowing at all what it really might have been. So, you know, is it winter kill? Is it pesticides? Is the pest is diseases? What we're hoping is that the, and then in those type of surveys, generally another six months or so, you finally get the report from the year. We want to allow every beekeeper with a smartphone who is trained either through things like our courses or through associations like yours to recognize things like foul brood and so on, so that we have some confidence that they're providing reliable inspection reports. And the moment you put in your inspection report, we'll get it and it'll be added to the maps. Now, I'll show you an example of that in a moment. So we, as I say, our gateway to our app is through a, our Bee Health Guru bulletin board. Uh, and we ask for a small donation because at this point we're self-funded. Uh, you can get money to do research in the United States. It's much harder to get money to produce uh, and market something. And right at the moment, I'm a scientist, not a businessman. So we're asking for a, a, to a small donation that allows us to pay for our cloud storage, that allows us to pay for our app developer, and allows me to pay my colleague who does all of the retraining of the app for the calibration part. And so one of the things we've realized though, is we really think people should be using the external microphone if at all possible, because we seem to be getting better results. And this www.behealth.guru, and you gotta put it in just this way. You can't drop the www, that'll send you the GoDaddy and, you'll, and they'll try to sell you a uh, GoDaddy domain. Uh, no, you gotta put in the www and then Be Health is a domain and it's a dot guru, not a dot org or a dot com. Put that in and you can do that tonight even and you, you can read the uh, uh, website we've set up to talk about and to converse about the uh, our app. Uh, it doesn't, most, mostly at the moment is instruction type of things, but my goal in the next six months here is to really knuckle down and produce training videos and start having regular Zoom sessions with people that are helping us uh, calibrate and develop this app. So, so here's what the app looks like um, on an Android phone. Well, actually this is on an iPad. Um, the August, the older version from 19, 2019, 2020 is on the left. The one on the right doesn't look much different unless you look at the bottom line. And then you see a globe, that's the mapping thing, a history, that's where you get your inspection reports, a report thing where that's where you can do the recording one day and come back another day and inspect the colony so you don't have to do them all at the same time. And that upload button over there on the right hand side, you put once you're, you've gotten some recordings and inspections, you come home, you get near your computer and hook to your wireless and you push the upload and everything, recordings, inspections, the GPS locations, the time, date, all that you did and so on automatically upload, just push one button. So here's an example. The, uh, you, in this case, you was using the uh, microphone on the bottom of an iPad. Uh, you see it put in the, this is all, you, you essentially click on the B icon for the, uh, of a, for the app, the app loads automatically. It essentially comes up, it gives you this splash page and immediately it tells you the time, the date and the location that you're at. And then it allows you to choose whether you wanna do a 30 second scan or a better 60 second scan. And the green bar tells you how good the volume is that you're recording. Biggest problem we have is the people, you know, either the microphone's too far away from the bees or they haven't, uh, the volume is too low and they're just not getting a really good sample. So we're hoping that people either shove the phones in far enough or get the microphones in far enough that you get the recording bouncing around in this area, not down in this area. So these are the factors that we know based on our studies where we have same similar types of boxes, uh, similar races of bees over a similar region with high-end recorders and so on, we can essentially detect whether it's queen right or not, whether it's got varroa mites and somewhat about the level of the mites, whether it's Africanized or not, whether it has small high beetles, whether it has foul brood, uh, whether it has nosema, is this colony failing? Now, people say, well, it's a failing colony. A failing colony is one that 
looks doesn't look like any of the rest of them. The rest of them in your apiary, assuming you got more than one, is essentially is dramatically different. It's small. It's it's not growing. Or it's it's got problems with it. So, and in other words, the and then the one that really throws people for a loop is not normal. Failing, we figure you can say, hey, look at that. That's a dud. I mean, most of you out there know which ones of your colonies are having a problem. So you can at least tick the box. That's a failing colony. And then there are some new, you know, we keep coming up with new viruses and new diseases that we haven't trained for or haven't really been looked at, uh, like this idiopathic um, um, European fowl brood that Randy talks about that some of us have seen. Well, that might result in a sound of the colony that we've never seen before from a colony. So if the colony sounds don't fit in the sounds of normal colonies or colonies that have factors that the system can recognize, it'll throw it in the not normal area. So these bars, what they mean is like that five to 7%. Yeah, this is a zero to 100%. So this thing says this particular hive essentially had a 6% chance that it might be queenless. Well, you wouldn't worry about that unless it gets up to about 50% you're not gonna worry. But notice down there on fowl brood, it says 44%, 0.3%, uh, it might have fowl brood. I would say at that, I would open up the hive and be damn sure to inspect that hive to see if you got an early stage fowl brood. In fact, on the app, and frankly, we're still struggling to, to really get the calibration going well uh, on a smartphone. But the one of these factors that surprises us that seems to be uh, the most reliable and the most sensitive is actually working at the moment is that a fowl brood. And it's actually picking up a pre-emergent uh, fowl brood. That is, it's picking up colonies that are on the cusp of displaying cells with fowl brood, but haven't quite done so yet. So if you ever get a reading in a fowl brood of 40 to 50% or more, and you look and you don't see anything, take a look and see if that colony looks a little odd or listless or so on, and check it back in a week or two. You just might find out that uh, you got a... Um, a case of fowl brood building there. So um, now here I talked about these inspection reports and I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, when you do the inspection report, you see things like small high beetle and you'll have a uh, none mild, moderate, severe. The 26.4 here says the analysis, the acoustic analysis thinks there's a chance you got you know, 25, 26% chance you might have small high beetle. Uh, when you inspect, then we want you to say whether you see any, you know, if it's none, it's none. Uh, do you see a few? Well, that's kind of a mild. But each one of these variables, like on fowl boot, says 43.8. If, when you, you know, in that fowl boot, did you see fowl boot? Yes or no? Yes, no. We kept that one pretty simple and something. But you see that question mark there for every one of these variables. If you say, well, I really don't think I know enough about this to be able to identify or see, say, fowl boot if it's there. I'm not sure I know what a small high beetle is. Just click on the arrow of the question mark and you'll get a help screen that shows you pictures and tells you about the uh, problem and how you should rake it. Now, I've been talking about the maps. This is something I'm really excited about. You can, once you have uploaded your health factors for Queenless, Varroa and so on, and these maps at this point are based on the visual inspections, not on the acoustic uh, attempts of the app to acoustically analyze what's going on. But you can see, you can set, you can put in your date, then you can put in whether you, in this case, these are two maps from 2019 to 2021, just giving you an idea of colonies that don't have problems in the green over on the left, colonies that do have problems up on the right. We can do this for every single one of those eight factors. You can look at every single one of the eight factors. What you can't do is you cannot zoom in closer than say a couple counties or a state, depending on the size of your state, um, so that you can't pick out your neighbor and see what they're doing and so on. Although you might know somebody in the commencement Bay Area is having some problems because you see some dots showing up. We, on the other hand, have access to drill down right to where your columns are at so that we can do statistics on, you know, and see is this neighbor spreading to this neighbor, is this spreading to the other? Uh, but we are committed to protecting your privacy, so your data and your colonies and whether they're healthy or not. And if they got a problem is your business. And we're not sharing that with your uh, friends other than like the COVID maps that show the states, you know, that, you know, 
the numbers of cases there. Um, but they don't tell you who, if they say, well, we got somebody died last night in the hospital. They don't necessarily run out the, the name right away. Or we saw a, a group of people that are showing up with, um, um, with COVID and, and test positive for COVID, but they won't tell you whether say like in our town, are those university kids or are they senior citizens? So in the same way, we think this information is got to be protected, which is why it took us so long to add this capability because we have to be able to access it down to the uh, specific points to be able to really start to look for trends and, and what's going on. But we need to protect your confidentiality, whether you got one bee colony or you got 10,000. And so those, those dots will be on a <clears throat> larger region basis. So uh, coming back to the home screen here, you can see at the bottom, there's a thing on settings that tell you a variety about it, information about the app. That world globe pops you into the uh, maps you see. The history is your history of all the reports you filled out. In this case, there are nine colonies that have been recorded, but they haven't been inspected yet. And there are eight colonies that have been recorded and inspected and are waiting for an upload. And it's so the moment you get near a wireless, you can and hook and connect to your wireless, you can put a push a button. Now do not try to upload all this from your phone unless you got a 5G system or something because these are these recordings are really big files and it will take a long time. Uh, so go for the best wireless you can find or hotspot. You want a fast connection, but it shouldn't be too bad. Don't wait for five weeks before you send up say 200 uh, um, recordings and things. One is it'll just it going to be more more likely to be problematic in terms of upload speeds. The other thing is that it kind of uh, defeats the purpose of immediate flagging and problems. We want to be able to do that by next summer, hopefully, where we can look at the thing and say, well, this week I think it's pretty calm, but it's getting into August and we're not seeing much in terms of reports of roller problems yet. And then the week after, all of a sudden, says, wow, look at that hot spot. There, there's an area over in North Dakota that uh, they're really starting to report. Uh, uh, lots of varroa mites. So imagine how that can help you in, in managing your hives. If you're a small beekeeper, you know whether or not in your region uh, there's varroa problems. If you're a commercial beekeeper, they will. We are setting up programs where they can essentially uh, plot which of their apiaries have problems and prioritize them for what their management crews are going to be doing. So with all that, just to the final kind of overview of all this app and acoustic stuff. Our ultimate goal will be to eliminate the visual inspections. If we can trust the analysis, then we don't have to do the visual inspections. And that would really be nice in terms of labor uh, and time and, and cost savings. Um, uh, we do recognize that's a big stretch, but we have received already several thousand recordings. But what we learned in 2019 and 2020 and a lot of them were low volume or unusable due to engine noises, tractors, airplanes going over and so on. And remember, you're trying to use the sound the bee produces to analyze what's wrong with that colony. You want it quiet around. Most people heeded our warning about, you know, re-record if an airplane goes over right, when you're doing this. But what we didn't understand was that we were amazed at how many beekeepers sing and talk particularly singing while they work their hives. And so um, we got a lot of beekeeper songs, but uh, that doesn't help us in the quality of the bee recordings. I'm glad though, because it means that beekeepers apparently are happy when they're working their bees. But for a little while, you got you know, you got to kind of keep your mouth shut. Okay, so as I say, for 2021, we're vastly uh, improved, be able to keep records, to use it for management, to produce uh, the first ever real-time automatic automated reporting and plotting of pests and disease outbreaks. Uh, they're going to be specifically mostly in the U.S. and Canada, although we're working closely with groups down in New Zealand and Australia, and we're starting to get some traction over in Europe. But, you know, I look forward to the day that we can hopefully someday maybe be able to do away with high inspection, visual, and rely on the sound analyses. Um, so, where are we at with this? Well, we need individuals to help, but associations like yours can really help us because what we found when we did the work with Puget Sound and Pierce County, 
back in the 80s. It really helps to just like you have your, what should you be doing with your bees this, this uh, month to have knowledgeable people saying, who have you seen apps? Who have you used the apps? What did you find? Um, did you have any problem identifying uh, what you were looking at visually and so on? Be kind of the someone to look over their shoulders and things like, we'd really like you to see you get an external microphone that adds a little extra cost. Maybe the association buys a few and passes them around and you can trade them off to your neighbors and stuff like this uh, to get the recordings that we want. So uh, kind of local cent kind of concentric areas uh, where we get a little bit more higher resolution of what's going on would be really, really helpful to us. So my request for you to, to you and to everyone I talked to in the last couple of months is let's start reporting and tracking bee health incidents as they occur in real time and mapping those as we continue to work on the goal of calibrating the app so that it's accurate and reliable. Uh, we know it's going to make mistakes, but we can't correct them until we get uh, recordings paired with inspections. And then we take all the ones that got right, put them in one bucket, and we take all the ones that got wrong and put them in another bucket, and then we retrain it. So the whole goal here is to keep these little gals healthy, like this one, and happy. And so I did mention a microphone. Uh, we recommend this particular one. It's about $70, but it's a very flat response and it's pretty sensitive. And so we get vastly improved audio quality and it allows you, if you take it and I'll show you in a moment, you, you, you take the little fuzzy bonnet off of it, that windshield is fine except bees eat it. And so if you stick a microphone in with a, with a fuzzy, um, windshield on it, it'll come out shredded out the other end and your recording will have a lot of chomping uh, and tearing sounds. So you, you pull off the little windshield, uh, the windshield on the thing, um, you get rid of the clip that's there and I'll show you in a moment how you can fix it to a wire so that you can slide that microphone deep into the colony. And so here, here's our microphones, having the windshield taken off, uh, taking the clip off. I actually salvaged a little bit of the clip here uh, this is just a piece of thin wire with a little hook in it and so on to hold the mic. Here's where you want it in a standard hive. You want it as close to the center of the bottom board facing up towards the cluster as you can get. And that's going to give you the very best recordings uh, and the quality of the recording greatly affects the accuracy of the app. So, and I do say leave enough, make this wire long enough to get a handle on the outside so you can easily slide it in and out. And they don't really like something like the microphone to phone slid in. So do it gently, slowly. And if you have a microphone, having two is even better because you can slide one in, walk over to another colony, slide it in. By the time you get back to the first one, you can plug your phone onto it and the bees will have settled down. So again, here's an example, you know, it shows like you gotta put a little bit of a handle on the end so that you can get a hold of them and you insert them through the entrance. So Everything we're doing with the app can be reached and found at www.behealthguru. If you, it doesn't cost you anything to register. If you register, you can not only, you, if you don't register, you can read. If you register, you can read and comment. Uh, and if you want to try to help us with the app, uh, there's a donation button. And for we're asking, we'd like to see $20. Uh, we think that's pretty cheap considering what we're, we're giving you as a, uh, not only as a tool to have, uh, where you're helping us, but there's a high management tool here for some of the major health issues. And if you just managed to track those eight issues, uh, that would be for many people, a, a real help. Now, the last thing I'm gonna say is that people are gonna ask me, well, could bees pick up the sound for this? Or could bees be used for this? We don't know, but there's no reason why we can't test it. The only way we find out is you get a bunch of colonies that have whatever it is, that, like small high beetle, at different concentrations and then you get recordings from them and you you send us back the records and the analyses and we can tell you whether or not we can find whatever this thing is um, that you wonder whether sound could be used for and if it turns out to be useful we can certainly then add it it's very easy for us to add those things into our app uh, that part of the app is almost just a cut and paste so one last thing, I know you're concerned in your area about the, uh, the murder hornets. I don't like that term. Uh, the Japanese have lived with them a long time. They actually 
have, sometimes keep them as pets. They, they use them for different things. They even have some type of food products and so on derived from them. They use screens on their hives uh, that uh, keep the uh, hornets out. Uh, yeah, you don't, it's not something we want to introduce. We really want to be vigilant. One of the things that could probably be done if it's before your state folks nuke uh, a nest of the hornets, if someone with microphone in our app could get recordings of the hornet sound and with recordings of the hornet sound, we could probably add it to our app. So if a hornet strayed into your hive or there were hornets in your hive, uh, you're probably gonna see them. But anyway, be another way of picking it up or maybe even with a shotgun microphone, you could, you could find hornet nests or even track them. Uh, some of that work was done in terms of tracking feral colonies in trees at Oak Ridge National Laboratories by Howard Kerr well, back in the, um, in the 80s um, using shotgun mics. He just walked through the woods and waved the mic around looking for bee colonies. So uh, the sound work uh, is intriguing and this is, you know, continues to amaze me. And so I'm hoping that folks like yourself and associations like yours will step up to the plate and redo the type of thing we did when we did the study with Puget Sound and Pierce County and, and Whidbey Island beekeepers and set off everything that you have basically seen tonight. So in one sense, you folks and your, your predecessors in the work that they did with us essentially did something novel and unique that really set the direction for my entire 48 year career. So that's part of the reason why I was so happy to be able to talk to, to Puget Sound beekeepers tonight. And let me get out of the share. Wow, Jerry, that's really fascinating information. Jerry, thank you so much. That was just great. And for anybody who's listening, I have the app. Uh, I got it in 2019 and I absolutely love it. And um, I'm not real tech and even I can use it. Well, one of the things, thank you, Kathy. And one of the things that we did, we're scientists, not business people, uh, but we think we've got something that can help. I mean, it's, and, I, we did do some work on CCD and we, we, we came up with what we thought called CCD, the, the publication out there that has had over 90,000 views. However, USDA says we're wrong. So, you know, but I got tired of tilting windmills. So the, rather than <laughs> try to essentially prove that this causes CCD or something, and we're still working on that. We've got some independent verification of our, 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 our conjecture there, but trying to do something that really benefits beekeepers. And, and the other thing is that, for those of you who go to our WAS site, uh, back in October of 2015, Frank Linton, uh, a former MITRE scientist in Maryland and myself have been involved since 2012 with setting up conferences for our counterparts around the world that are looking at hive sensor systems, scales and infrared systems and whatever. And I could go on for a couple of more days on all that stuff. But there are 50 presentations from 14 different countries from last October that are on the University of Montana's website under our, um, uh, where you go through, you go to www.umt.edu forward slash Bees, B E E S. And when you get into where you register or look up our courses and so on, you'll find a link to the uh, colony monitoring studies and so on. So if you want to know what, what's the state of all that is at the moment, what's smoke and mirrors, what's showing promise, what's still pretty preliminary and so on, that's the bench, bench, benchmark you'll find. So, so um, questions. You actually answered a few of them. <laughs> um, but I, I was gonna start with the first question that came in, which was actually taking you back a little bit to uh, the earlier studies that you, you did. Um, Jeff was asking how you think the, the smoke is affecting colony health on the West Coast. Well, it certainly isn't doing them any good. Um, and in fact, for our training and so on, it sometimes is a real problem because people say, well, how do you train bees when you got a big floral bloom out? 
Well, that's the cause of the problem, but it's easier to train bees when there's a bloom on and get them to not be distracted by the native vegetation than it is to get bees that aren't flying, to start flying in order to search for us and so on. Well, what happens in, in Missoula, we are the hub of the five valleys, which means if you're coming through Montana, north, south, east, or west, and you want to get across the Rockies and over towards uh, Washington, you come through Missoula, generally, unless you go way up almost to Canada. And so we are basically the, uh, the, the, all the roads go through here. And the, um, the problem with that is, is all those canyons and mountain ranges funnel the smoke from every fire in every direction. So unfortunately, we used to have every five to 10 years when we had a smoke incident. Nowadays, it's every summer. And the only question is how early, you know, and our valley isn't very big. You know, it's a small bowl shaped valley. And I live in a, in a house that looks out across the valley. And there are days where I can't see the mountains on the other side. It's that bad. Um, so we're probably ground zero for a test site for what smoke does. And we've got sensors in our highs and stuff like this. And so a little bit of smoke, they do like you and I do and so on. They'll, they'll go out and they'll continue their work and so on. But if there's a real fire blowing down on a call, like a grass fire or something, I've seen this where fire coming in fast, those bees are essentially head down, loading up on fuel and so on in the case they have to leave. They're getting ready to evacuate, just like you know people rush around their house, get their records and so on. Um, if it's just kind of bad, they, they you may see a little bit, a little, well, do we really want to get out the soon, a little bit of lackadaisical thing, but they'll still work and so on. When it gets really thick to the point you can't see the mountains on the other side. They do the same thing as all the people that work at the university here where we have these uh, bedroom communities 10, 20, 30 miles out that people commute from every day. And when some of these fires are up those valleys and stuff like that, people call in and say, I'm not coming into work today because the fire is on the ridge, across the ridge. I'm staying home in case we have to leave. Well, guess what? When it gets really thick, the bees do the same thing. They just stay home. <laughs> They're not going to go out at all. <laughs> so, yeah, it has an effect. And combined with drought, I'm sure it has an effect. Uh, we did work on bees in uh, spruce budworm right after Mount St. Helens went off. And the dust from Mount St. Helens, those folks that like old ratty highs with uh, lids half all off of, they took big brood hits because uh, that ash would sift into the brood nests and so on. So, not fun. Good question. Doesn't sound good. I couldn't see the mountains on the other side, but my, bee were, my bees were still out today. I'm, I'm in West Yellowstone. Um, <laughs> um, a uh, question that I actually was going to ask, so thank you, Svens, for asking it. Can can uh, you use, let's say you have a screen bottom board and you either remove the sticky board or you don't have it in place, could you use your app to record directly from underneath the hive? Um, you advice? can. We, we have a slid in. The problem we found is that people don't want to get stung and you got to be able to push that little button in the thing. And so we tried to make it, you know, as I started to say, we hired an app designer. He's actually work, commutes to Seattle back and forth and so on. He's in to, works with Oculus with virtual reality and stuff. And he's an artist. And he really does. Uh, he's a computer guy that's a musician and an artist. And he's the prop. I think we made the right cha uh, uh, choice because I think Kathy can say, he said, no, you're, no, I know you guys as, as scientists want all this stuff and stuff like that, but you'll never get people to do that. You know? <laughs> and, so and I've seen a lot of these bee management programs, that were, whether they're free or for a chart. The problem is that they put in too much stuff and it's too awkward to work through. So we have this thing. I can run that whole app from end to end in two minutes and so on. And it just, you know, with a half a dozen hits or something. So. So we tried, we use that to try to make this app really easy, but it does appear that, you know, yes, we'd rather get a recording from a phone shoved as far in as you can get it than no recording at all, because we'd love to be able to say your phone will do it. And so, so that's one, you know, we have to stratify these things out to the different, but we really found that if we're really going to start drilling down, we really need some better, you know, some deeper ends of the hive type of things. In our own hives, we actually drill eight, one eight inch hole from the backside in and the and put a little plug in it because the bees will plug it up if you don't, and then pull the plug out and just run the 
the microphone in from there to try to get him even closer to the center of the hive. But, uh, but it, you know, and then, it, but you did mention about screen up. We do have on that, well, the Varola mite, we actually think that, and some people hotly debate this about, you know, Randy and his magic washes. I mean, that's fine. They're great. If you're doing this thing, it's a, it's a established protocol. And he's got numbers and so on the thresholds. And Randy's testing for us, but uh, he wants to bypass uh, all the nonsense, the analysis and stuff like this. Just let the app do that in the background and so on. So he can move through it fast and he just sends us a spreadsheet of what his washers are, you know. And so, well, that's fine. I would take that anyway and get it. But we can't do that with everybody. Thousands, you know, people, people are disappointed we don't talk to everyone that sends us a sample. Well, we had 20,000 samples coming in last year. So it's a little hard to do with a couple, with just a handful of folks. But uh, so, so, uh, that's why we're going to try to start using this uh, bulletin board for more interaction, put some videos on it, put some uh, signs when people can call in. But, but we actually think that for the average backyard beekeeper, we'd re that uh, the sticky traps would be a great way to do it because it could be standardized. And as long as it's, it's a Delta function, what's it like today versus tomorrow type of thing and so on. That's the same. And I've seen Ramesh show a thing. He said, well, sticky tracks aren't as good. And I looked at the curves that are exactly the same curve. It's just that you pick up fewer because you're not, you know, kill them by a wash and stuff. But you'll see the same trends. And that's what we're really looking for is where the dynamics are on the on the upsweep or the downsweep and so on. So so we think sticky traps uh, are, are perfect. We, as long as we know what you're doing, you know, what you use. If it's a wash, we can take the number from the wash. If it's a sticky trap, we can use those numbers. Cool, thank you. Um, and then one last question just came in from, from Jeff. Uh, about when we should do the OD recordings, actually. Um, okay, so that's a good question. We really want them um, when the bees are flying and actively foraging. Uh, and, you know, here in Montana, they're under snow in the wintertime. So we haven't done any work with a, in a milder climate where we could actually see whether those sounds change in the winter type of thing or when they're broodless and so on. That's something, again, we'll find out if we can get, you know, but the only way to do it is if lots of people send us records and we know what's going on. But in the summer, which is where we figure it, you're out, and that's when it's important the colonies are growing, the mites and stuff like this, uh, dynamics start to kick in. We like you go in, you know, that sweet spot between like in most clients around 10 in the morning to three, four in the afternoon is the best because the bees are active. We're, we, we do, you know, if you, you in the sheds, these wintering sheds we've looked at, once they're in the dark under really stable environmental conditions with not, you know, the fans blowing a constant uh, ventilation past them and not much change in humidity and so on, uh, they become almost so quiet that you can't hear them with a the stethoscope. So uh, they're probably not telling us what's in those sheds. And the problem in the sheds then is those fans and stuff make a lot of noise, but, uh, um, but we're still learning. So, uh, but yeah, you know, right now we're aiming at that, the growing season and we're aiming at, so uh, I had hoped that our app and our upgrades would have been ready earlier in 2021, but our app developer himself got COVID and that kind of threw a wrinkle, a wrinkle in the things or he thinks he has COVID and something hit him that, that really slowed him down. But we, we just took a, 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 the time to really roll over sleeves and it doesn't look like a big change, but it is a big change uh, uh, in terms of the accessibility and being able to use it as a standalone bee management app. Um, and so, and as I say, if you make a donation for the first few years, you know, once you donate, you know, you get a free, updates for free. So, uh, but it does cost us money. <laughs> we are, the other thing I will say is that we are, we, we are working with a couple other companies, as I said, that have in hive sensors, but they have the engineering chop taps. We don't, you know, we're, you know, spinoff of an educational institution. We don't have the manufacturing capability and stuff. We we tried, and then we decided this is just not what we're equipped for. But what we do have is 20 some years of experience that in all of these sensor systems and 20 or 30 years that others don't. And so we know what works, what doesn't work, and where the problems are going to show up. And just working with two companies, we could have saved them probably a year or two of R and D and tens of thousands of dollars if it just talked to us <laughs> because they're finding out all of the Murphy's law and all the things that don't work. <laughs> Bees really don't like weird things in their hives. <laughs> but um, we're, we're hoping that what, uh, that we're geared up at the moment that uh, this fall we can, we, with the new app, we can hit the ground running in New Zealand and Australia to do the Southern hemisphere. And we're 
putting together a team, we're going to go back to the National Science Foundation and see if if we can spin this in a way of, you know, there are some some pr programs that are in the Department of Energy they call them grand challenge programs. The electric cars and, and the self driving cars came out of DARPA's challenge program. NSF has come up with a uh, you know an innovation or basically game changing type of things. That's what DARPA was about. You know, high risk but high payoff if it works. But if it doesn't, they move away from it in a hurry. And we're we're going to go full out uh, this fall to see if we can put together a team, including uh, a unique new aspect of beekeeping and beekeepers that we've seen, the hobby beekeepers in the backyards, the commercial guys, and then start to bring in associations and see if we can formalize some of this testing more and maybe provide some help for the testers to buy the microphones and stuff like this so we can get leverage that more. So I don't know where it's going to go. You know, if it falls on its face, it falls on its face, but I've got to work 20 years into it now. So I know it can work. Uh, you know, so I really wanted to work using the, these type of devices, but it just took a long time before we had something. It's, it's like the electric car. When I was a kid, you read in popular County, electric cars around the corner. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> batteries were the problem. We had the same problem with processors being too big, too bulky, too slow, um, too, too much power. Um, that changed in 2018. So, you know, for about 10 years, we twiddled our thumbs, <laughs> frustrated because we just couldn't come up with an affordable, portable, small system. And that makes sense. Um, technology sometimes. And Kathy, I love your question. Uh, Kathy is actually wondering if bees have accents. Do you already have data on like whether they speak differently in different countries? Yes, that's a great question. So Frank Lindsay, a commercial beekeeper in about my age, actually his wife exactly my age, uh, is um, and he works a lot with a lot of bee clubs and stuff in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, but Frank uh, was an early adopter and early tester. And in 2012, we had some handheld systems we put together because it was about $1,800 a piece. You see why the technology problem had a Raspberry Pi in it, but <laughs> a little too spendy. Um, but anyway, Frank, Frank uh, had a lot of fun going out, and then he stuck them in his eyes. And one of the variables we look for is Africanized bees. And in the US, Africanized bees essentially uh, ones that are pretty well over on the African sides of the hybridization and stuff like that sound very di different than European bees. And the guy in Oak Ridge that used the shotgun microphones also had a little capsule that you would put a bee, catch a bee, put it in the capsule, put the little clear top on the handle had red, green, and yellow uh, Nixie light, uh, lights on it. And the bee would fly toward the sun. And because Africanized bees, the true you know, if you went to Africa, so the, the true African bee is slightly smaller than the European bee, which means that the where the wings are mounted on that carapace of the uh, on the thorax, it's a little different spring, which produces a different wing beat frequency. And so we can get some really good discrimination of Africanized bee from uh, the other. Now, the guy with these little capsule could tell the extreme, but he couldn't tell anything in between. We're hoping to fill in, you know, the gradient from mostly American. Uh, one of the signs that, that shows us that works is I ran into with the, uh, uh, in New York, a beekeeper who on Long Island, who has family in England. And so every summer he takes vacation to the UK. So he has bees and he's involved with the uh, bee wellness there and so on. So in Long Island, so he was getting, and he was interested to get 1%, 2%, 5% might be Africanized. Well, it's probably not Africanized in New York, but again, this is a probability and there's something in the sounds a little off, you know, from the standard European. He goes to England, he got 0% on everything he did. So obviously, you know, the apples are responding to different, but from Kathy's question, the New Zealand ones are the fun one. Frank goes out, he calls me up and he says, I stuck it into the hive and it says my hives are Africanized. <laughs> and it's pretty clear there's no African bees in New Zealand. And I think, and, but then he went over to his neighbors who was running a different line of bees and his neighbors didn't say that. But Frank's bees came off as Africanized. Well, Africanized bees are really noisy. I mean, I've, I've seen a real thing in Guatemala and so on. So, I mean, I know what a Africanized bee is and in Texas and so on. But um, so what I think is happening here is that uh, 
like us, the New Zealanders really clamped down on importation of queens in more recent years, decades or so. But their main bee industry grew, uh, was introduced and developed long after ours did here in the US. And they got bees from different areas we did. And one of the things they liked, they liked the black bee and so on. And they brought in a lot of that. So if you look at the genetics, they tend to have more of a swing toward Jack, black bee and some others. So they got a different race in what we call way. You are going to argue that the subspecies or use the terminology race, which is debated and so on. But it's just like we got carnies and Italians and so on. They've got a New Zealand bee and so on. And so we didn't train it on the New Zealand bee. So it doesn't know. Now, Michelle Taylor, who... Uh, is one of the scientists working on Barola in New Zealand, and her husband works on the compliance side. She came and did her master's work with us many years ago in the U.S., and then spent some time out in, in um, Maryland on our Aberdeen study. And when she first came to the U.S., we couldn't understand her. <laughs> she would talk about the bay. She was looking for the bay, for the bays of bees, you know. <laughs> and so her husband went in to get a haircut, and the barbershop guy couldn't understand him. And it's next to an, air, to an army base. So you can imagine the haircut her husband showed up with, <laughs> where she was shocked when he came home. <laughs> he got a military cut and stuff. Well, I've been in New Zealand and in, in, in Australia and in the big cities, you know, the English is much less of an accent or dialect and in the rural areas just like it are you know and that's i mean scott my co-instructor on the classes and so on is from the georgia uh alabama area and so on you never guess it you will never confuse scott and myself in terms of our dialects and so on and when he uses the uh language things uh like dragon speaking naturally or siri or alexa stuff, uh the best of the language uh, translators actually now have things like Georgia shift. And when he puts in a Georgia shift, it zeroes in on him. But if he doesn't use the Georgia shift option, it does a really lousy job <laughs> to his transcription. So yes, Kathy, <laughs> just as much as I have uh, my former student, and we've been away from each other for a while, we have to go back through a relearning process so we can understand each other. <laughs> and, and the Australian bees have the same type of thing. So there are dialects in bees. And that's part of the reason why we have to have people here, because although we tried to cover friendly large area of the uh, U.S. when we did our testing, it's still basically from the Midwest down through the run for the Rocky Mountains and stuff like that, that we have most of our test groups because that's where the researchers were doing things uh, up in Edmonton. So there's probably regional shifts even, you know, if, if we can tell the difference between Italian, there's probably regional shifts even across the United States. And, and those are things that are probably affecting the accuracy of the app. So Again, just, just like these language things, you re, I mean, you have to have a huge data sets to really dial these things in. You can kind of get the first notch in with a, a fair size sample, but then to really dial it in, it takes more. And that, yeah, I mean, it, they didn't get the human speech recognition overnight. <laughs> but yes, bees have dialects. <laughs> Great question. Awesome, thank you. That is it for the questions. I don't know if there's any last question coming any in. Any live questions someone wants to ask? Just turn your microphone on. We're out, everybody, it looks like. <laughs> be true. Just kicking back and relaxing as we pick up your car. Can you get paid on the spot? Thanks again, Jerry. Oh, you're welcome. Good to see you tonight. Yeah, good to see you again. Uh, I, I will, I have, since you don't have questions, I'll, you asked for bee behavior, Kathy. So I, I mean, we've done so much that I couldn't even begin to cover everything we've done in almost 50 years. But uh, uh, we did a couple things there that you might find amusing. Uh, one was right after an attack on one of our naval vessels over in the Middle East, DARPA wanted to know if we could get bees to search boats. So search boats, ships. Oh, boats. Uh-huh. So container ships and that type of thing. Or a, a boat or ship coming, advancing toward you like the attack that was made and so on. So DARPA rented a, uh, a pontoon boat and we were in the Gulf of Mexico and I rented some bees and from uh, one of the bee inspectors there and half of the bees I rented went onto this pontoon boat and half of them went on land where we were doing some laser work with one of the Air Force bases. And 
when we put and the idea was could you get the bees to search from boat to boat or boat to land and so the bees are on the boat and the water was pretty choppy for the first couple of days after we put them on the on the pontoon boat Enough so that none of us had enough guts to take it out of the Gulf of Mexico uh, until the water <laughs> started, calmed down a little bit. And there wasn't a bee that came out of those hives. Uh-uh, they weren't going to come out. But the bees on land were flying, you know, went to work right away and stuff like this. Well, after about 48 hours, suddenly something happened and those hives decided, well, this is the new reality. And they started flying. And so we then took them out and I was on shore with targets and the boat was about a half mile off and so on. And then the bees flew right from the boat over to the land and searched the land and came back and so on. And one of the uh, guys on the pontoon boat had another come pick him up because he had something else to do. <laughs> and as the boat was coming out to pick him up, it was circling around to the far side so they didn't cut between the boat and the land where we were doing the studies. So they were, about, they were circling around from the pack about a mile out to sea. <laughs> the poor bee lands on the boat just nearly exhausted you know so like finally found something it's going the wrong way <laughs> <laughs> so then there is the what we have found in all of our training people say how do we train bees well it's reward based but we have to have uh, microprocessor controlled uh, feeder dishes so that we can isolate the reward system that's associated with the odor so odor and they get a reward no odor they don't get a reward feeder empty, they have to search, feeder full, they can fill up. And we had to get ourselves out of the picture because we started off by just squirting, you know, pouring syrup into these trays and stuff. They began, they immediately learned who we were and what vehicle we drove and, <laughs> and, and what time of day we showed up and so on. Uh -huh. uh, all those type of things. So, and Lenny, we had one thing where DARPA said, could you get them to fly from point A to B and ignore everything in between? So one of our apiaries is on a mountain uh, behind the university. They're the big university housing area and the uh, uh, basic residential district. But two miles from the mountain is a game, a football field, soccer fields, and a high school. And we got those bees to fly from the mountain to, to the um, high school without stopping in between. And then they would redeploy there. But to do so, we had to walk them out about a block at a time, you know, again, you know, the food was moving uh, that way. Uh, and Lenny uh -huh. didn't want to have to lean down. So he built a table on wheels that he could just cart, he could just push along. But we also needed to know how fast those bees could come. And we wanted to know whether they were coming from the hills. So we would put paint drops on them to when they got to the, the feeder to mark them. Well, the interesting thing is it turns out it took them only took them about four minutes to get over that two miles from the hill back going both ways and they spent more time orienting at each end than they did in the flight mm -hmm. we also found that every backyard beekeeper and stuff their bees joined in like it was like you know the uh, campus equivalent of a of a beer you know of a of a party you know beers over here type of thing and so on come and on so, down <laughs> so we had unmarked bees that when we marked found out they were going in different directions and stuff from our, our source bees and so on but they got to know lenny so well and his vehicle then whenever we did a test to see if they would search at the area, we had the outlaw lane. Today, you're not coming. Today's the day we're doing the test because if you're there, they followed him like the Pied Piper everywhere he went. <laughs> so uh, the la great. last anecdote I'll tell you is these automated feeders have two stainless uh, probes in them and syrup conducts electricity. So one of the probes is in the bottom, one's at the top, one is full and it hits that probe, it shuts off the pumps. Uh, from the supply container. When it gets to the bottom and it's dry, hey, hold, there's no contact anymore and so on, it turns back on the pumps. When we got to New, and that's worked for us for, for over a decade, or two decades. We went to New Zealand about six years ago. We got to New Zealand, we set out our automated feeders. And a couple of days later, my colleague, Colin, who was over there, came back, called me up and said, Jerry, he says, those pumps aren't working right. He says, they're, they're turning on, staying on. I leave at the end of the day, we leave the pumps generally automatically cycling so that the bees continue to train until dark. He says, come back in the morning and it's just sopping wet on the ground. The pumps get turned on, they want to shut off. Well, it took a while and we found out that something in the water in that part of New Zealand is really corrosive. And the stainless probes in one to two weeks became so rusted and that they wouldn't conduct electricity. And we tried all kinds of, you know, higher grade stainless and cleaning and other things. None of it worked. So 
the next year we can't you know so summer you know, flip-flop so you know when he comes back from new zealand we spent that that you know we rolled over sleep if any of you have have cattle and stuff you have water tanks that have a float on the end of a hose or something like that and it floats down and it turns you know the water on and it floats up and shuts it off manually so we found little teeny uh plastic floats and we made the same for the bees and the feeders and so on and we figure out that'll do it you know nothing the corrode you know float goes down when the feeders dry float comes back up when the feeder failed worked like a champ for about three days another call from colin he said you'll never believe what's going on he says now he says i leave and i fill up all the jugs and stuff before i leave then five o'clock or something like this he says come back in the morning he says all the containers are empty but there's not a drop of syrup on the ground. It's just all disappearing. And then again, the one, do we have a fox or something like that, you know, slipping it up, you know, and so on. So again, nothing but with these bees, you got to basically get up at the crack of dawn, get there before they're there to see what the hell's going on. So those pumps make a noise. Pump comes on, up, fills the thing up. First bees in the morning come out when they're trained to these things, they'll hit those things as soon as it's daylight and stuff like this. So, you know, bees started to build up coming over and so on. They're slurping down, going back home, telling their nest mates, hey, the food's on type of thing, breakfast's on, and all they were on. <laughs> and they're starting to come more and more and so on. And he's watching and that float's going down and going down. It, 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 you know, the floats, figure out how, anyway, the float, float's doing its thing. Forget whether it was up or down that we had it set up. But anyway, the way it's set up, what was happening was that if the float was down, the pump came on, you know, you know, the thing's empty, float goes down. As it started to lower, all of a sudden, B after B started piling on the float. I'll be darned. Power bees on uh -huh. top of the float. And then the float went down like this, and then they just sat there. <laughs> and the pump ran and ran and ran, and all of their nest mates just kept coming and chowing down on syrup. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a those darn bees <laughs> he's a small animals the uh, guy and he admits that when he first started working with me he was sure that you know these were kind of little things with little you know you know pinhead brains and stuff like that how much could they process and do and uh he's uh he says you know when we first started i would never have said this but he says i think they know what the hell you're doing <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says, and that whole colony is communicating that. <laughs> and so on. We've seen lots of other examples, but but we know they know us. They know our vehicles. <laughs> they know oh, when yeah. we show up. <laughs> I have never done open feeding before, and I'm having a problem with arthritis, and I've got some tall hives. And so uh, I've been doing open feeding. And ever since I started, the bees follow me everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. they they follow me and they wait for me to come out of the house they'll just be waiting right outside the door when i come out there they are they follow me around and if they see white buckets yep. they they know exactly what they got going odor on. and and vision both yeah tied in. yeah yeah yep. well, when we were at southwest research institute um there was another group seeing if moths could do what we were doing with bees search out things because moths could pick up pheromone from miles away and so on well, it turned out the moths kind of live up to their flutterby or butterfly type of uh, characterization mm. because uh, they have a hot, they don't they're not quite as driven to, to focus in on something as bees are. And but the uh, we had a, we encountered a fifty year flood and we had to suspend work for a, a week or two. There's no sense of keeping the crews down in San Antonio, Texas, so we left Scott uh, to keep keep an eye on the bees, make sure the flood didn't flood them out and stuff and. We had a stockpile here with uh, 50 colonies of bees sitting off on this uh, campus. It, it was a big, big area. It fenced off a lot of buildings scattered around. And there was a small uh, block building about a half a mile from the uh, where we were keeping the bees. And the flood was actually encroaching in between the two. Well, in that small building is where the moth people did their study and they were using pheromones and so on. But it was the closest place that had a sink and water so it's where Scott was filling up the the feed, yeah, making up the syrup so that he could fill up the feeders over in the yard during those rain, continuous rain. You know, I mean, you just, you, there were houses floating down the gullies and stuff like that in San Antonio. I saw the national news and the guy, news reporter and house goes by behind him and stuff like this. So, I mean, <laughs> this is not trivial. And so, so 
all of a sudden we get a we get a call from the uh, the manager at Southwest Research Institute, a, um, a physicist, and he says, he says I'm not calling the complaint, but he says, but uh, <laughs> there, there's a vent and a, a fan on that uh, build that block building where the uh, moth study were doing. He says I don't know what's going on there because the moth crew wasn't there, but he says. He says there's a cloud of ease in the air outside of the building by that by that uh, vent. And I said, he says, well, why would the bees be at that building? I said, well, the other thing that makes any sense is that the pheromone that was oh, being yeah. essentially partitioned into the syrup being made in the building. And then, of course, feeding the bees syrup laced with moth pheromones. <laughs> bees out for He said, ah, that's where it all comes from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. My, uh, I leave my kitchen window open uh, during this nice weather. And whenever I'm mixing syrup, there uh, starts with one, two bees at the screen. By the time I'm done, there's thousands of bees just buzzing right outside the screen. And, uh, you know, it's just like they, it takes no time at all before they go do, do their little dance and tell the rest of them where the good smells are coming from. Well, the lesson learned after almost five decades working with bees is that, you know, and my wife's a K-12 teacher and an artist, she, she has, drives great uh, glee in, in this observation. That is, she's, we've lost count of the times when we thought, well, we'll do this and then we expect the bees to do that. And then, mm -hmm. as I've said, you know, you show up and the bees have essentially taken it and decided that they're going to do their own thing. And, right. um, you know, whatever it is we thought was going to happen didn't. So she has this kind of mental scoreboard, you know, bees and scientists, you know. <laughs> 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 when, I teach, when I teach beekeeping, I always tell people bees work according to rules, but not always. Mm -hmm. it's it's like they make up their own rules and they do something once and then they surprise you by doing something totally out of character well there, there's we have multiple instances where there's been problem solve evidence of problem solving that you just cannot imagine that super organism uh, we mm -hmm. a colleague of mine was looking at had a hives with temperature probes every one inch of space in the hives wow and then he decided, well, what would happen if some hot air showed up in the middle of the brood nest then expected your cold air? Well, so he put a eight inch pipe into that and he's got a glass wall on the thing. And, he, and you can see, he could, he can see the hits of the temperature probes and, and plot those. And he puffed in cold air and the bees didn't pay much attention, you know, and, well, it's a little cooler here, but it didn't seem to do much. And then he put in some pretty hot air and the bees, you could see on the uh, they, uh, on the sensors that the bees essentially backed the away and, and got away from it for a bit, and then you saw the bees kind of move more to this kind of a formation, and then they apparently started fanning. And in a matter of seconds, we saw hot air, just like water out of a fire nozzle, being shot out to the farthest and uh, hottest corner of the hive. Wow. by those bees so they you know what bee colony ever had that happen in their brood nest the uh, localized hot spot right. and they recognized it there was an initial response and then they collectively managed to divert and drive that heat away uh forming basically the equivalent of a water uh, nozzle through their fanny now if i did that same test with all of you folks sitting in a room and gave you all a hand fan and did this and so on. Would you get your act together? They're all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, people, people, people. So yeah. they hum they humble me every often. <laughs> yes, I, I I'm right there with you. Um, I never realized that I would be such a bee nut. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not a scientist, but I am definitely a bee nut. Well, and a lot of the stuff, you know, like this purse thing, the very simplest version of that was two, was a two index card with two bee shots in it, put together like this to catch the bee like this, put it over a glass and do the testing. So some of these things, you know, puffing through a straw were just the last, you know, a little uh, like perfume type of atomizer and stuff. So there's all mm -hmm. kinds of, you know, we're on the high end of the technology, you know, trying to, 
go for that nth degree accuracy and stuff. But there's a lot of things one can learn about those things just from observation. Oh, the observation is just amazing. I get a cup of coffee every morning and go out and sit in a, a chair out by my beehives and <laughs> just watch, you know, and I always see something new. Well, they anyway, always... we're, we're, uh, I think we're probably put in our time today. I'm really glad to see all yeah, you. Yeah, I bet everybody's gone home. So anyway, Jerry, it was nice talking with you. Thank you so much for uh, coming to Puget Sound Bees and uh, telling all us all of us about what you've been up to. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And and a lot of people didn't go home. They stayed. It's very yeah, We got really 20 cool. people. Oh, still shit, here. you're there. Hi. Yeah, there's, we there's have 45. We went up to about 43, 45, and there's still about 20. So I guess oh. they're not tired. Of, it's totally worn out yet. <laughs> yeah, well, it, no. it's, a it's a long time to sit, but you've done wonderfully. I'm amazed at your stamina. <laughs> Well, <laughs> hey, you know, learned a few things over all those years. <laughs> my, my, I'll leave you with this last thought. My as students and some of my peers and so on come back and say, well, that can't be or so on, because that's not what the books say. Mm. You know, and number one, we got technology available now that others didn't have. So sometimes, you know, observation and so on were limited by what they had accessible to them. Uh, sometimes we learn more and so we're interpreting things in a different ways. It's like the COVID thing, you know, science isn't static. And so as we learn, the science just changes and evolves, you know, in, in ways. Very fluid, is, yeah. And so on. And the, um, but uh, what I what I have reason to be sure of is you can take the, something like the hive and the honeybee and so on. And I don't think they can read yet. So <laughs> just because the book says this is what you should do. <laughs> Oh, and one last, that you're using the app, Kathy, I'll leave you one last thought. So you know that the little bee on the bottom of the app is the link to get to our um, um, bulletin board site uh, for all the right. information stuff. Right. Okay, so anytime you want more information on that front homepage, there's a bee at the bottom, you push that and it goes to the internet. So a Texas beekeeper in an area that has some Africanized bees around and so on, went out to a hive that's pretty feisty and so on, shoved her phone in and so on and her her actually her brother lives here in florence area and she had to call him she came back and says i shoved the phone in with the app into my kind of angry hive he says the bees essentially didn't like that phone and they really didn't like that picture of a bee on the bottom of the app so they piled on the picture of the bee on the app and they uh, there was enough bees enough capacity and contact there that they triggered the uh uh, the link and they log themselves into the bulletin board site. <laughs> well, that's good. I like that. <laughs> so we have the world's first bees that we don't only have, they don't even wait for us to monitor them. So they're learning how to log <laughs> They monitor there. themselves. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> They'll probably be ordering up one of these APMA highs or something. Let's upgrade here. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right, well, everyone. Well, good. Thank you again. Had a great night. Thank you. Good night, Jerry. All right. Bye. Thank you very much, Jerry. We appreciate you very much. Yeah, uh, you're welcome, Kit. Okay. Good night. And hopefully, we fingers crossed that uh, we got a good recording and everything here. Yes. Yes. I'm sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Wow, that was something. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, you learned something new. Very interesting. <laughs>